everybody calm down. Batmay is back. We started something last year that you guys really latched onto, and it centers around our shared love and admiration for the greatest interpretation of the Dark Knight there ever was, Batman the Animated Series. We've already covered the first 31 episodes, and I've gotten to talk about some absolute classics in that first batch. But the great thing about this show is that the hits just keep on coming. Robin's Reckoning, The Laughing Fish, His Silicon Soul, and so many more are just waiting for us to talk about them. And I didn't even mention Almost Gotham or Harley and Ivy yet. Old villains like the Penguin and Clayface return while new ones arrive, and favorites like the Riddler and Ra's al Ghul finally make their debuts. But the villains aren't the only characters who shine in this set of stories. Batgirl joins the fight for Gotham City, and Robin is given more depth as the show moves forward. Of course, Bruce and Batman are developed significantly as well. Plus, there are a few really weird episodes I'm very interested in hearing all your thoughts on. 2020 was a bit of a trial run to see if you guys wanted these episodes every year, and since that answer was a resounding yes, this year's reviews are going to be longer on average with more research and behind the scenes tidbits to add on to all the supplemental stuff we included last year, like commentary tracks from the creators and more. Again, using the 2018 Blu-ray collection as our guide, we're going to be discussing the next 31 episodes of this series in detail. That's one review per day, all month long. So join me once again as we take a look back at this animation touchstone, piece by piece, in Batman. We start Batman 2021 with an episode that's one of my favorites. Robin's Reckoning Part 1 kicks off an epic two-parter that shows us the origin of Dick Grayson through extended flashbacks while telling a corresponding story in present day. After Batman recognizes a name that a thug spits out to save his own hide, the Dark Knight starts acting colder than usual to Robin. Leaving him in the Batcave, Grayson uses the Batcomputer to research the name. Billy Marin. Turns out, Marin is an alias of a man named Tony Zuko. Years ago, Zuko was the person responsible for the death of Dick's parents, as we flash back to those events in detail. How Bruce takes in the young Grayson, some early caped crusader action, and turmoil between Batman and Robin are all covered in one of the best episodes of this series. During the early days of Season 1, Robin's appearances were sporadic. The creative team wanted to focus on Batman as a solo hero, but according to the book Batman Animated, writer Paul Dini says they were under a lot of pressure from the Fox Network, who originally aired the series, to include Robin on a much more consistent basis. Quote, when Fox changed the title from Batman the Animated Series to The Adventures of Batman and Robin, they laid down the law. No story premise was to be considered unless it was either a Robin story or one in which the Boy Wonder played a key role. Out were underworld character studies like it's never too late. In were traditional Batman and Robin escapades like The Lion and the Unicorn. A potentially intriguing Catwoman-Black Canary team-up was interrupted in mid-pitch to the network by their demand, Where's Robin? When the writers asked if they could omit Robin from just one episode, Fox obliged by omitting the entire story. Looking back, there was nothing drastically wrong with Robin's full-time insertion into the series. After all, kids do love him. Our major gripe at the time was that it started turning the series into the predictable Batman and Robin show people had initially expected it would be. For the first season, Batman had been an experiment we weren't sure would work. We were trying out different ways of telling all kinds of stories with Batman as our only constant. For better or worse, having a kid forced him and the series to settle down." End quote. There were apparently even talks of a Robin spin-off show that Fox briefly considered. Concept images were made featuring a younger-looking Robin, but that series never took flight. Regardless if more of the boy wonder in the show was forced or not, Robin's Reckoning is a favorite among the creative team, and even won them an Emmy for Outstanding Animated Program in 1993. The first half of Robin's Reckoning really does hit it out of the park. The writing, animation, music, and voice work create an emotionally riveting and visually stimulating 22 minutes. Randy Rogel is credited with the writing here, while Laren Bright and Alan Burnett were the story editors. The structure of Part 1 is perfectly paced, flawlessly weaving flashbacks into its narrative as we find out more about Dick's past and his present frustrations with Batman. In the flashbacks, we see Bruce connect with the young orphan in a few effective heart-to-heart -heart conversations. It's not going to be easy. 
You have to take it a day at a time. But for however long it takes, you have a home with us. Thanks, Mr. Wayne. Bruce. Bruce. Whenever we're shown one of those tender moments, it's undercut with the present-day Robin being openly frustrated with how Batman treats him. It creates an engaging juxtaposition and shows us how complicated their friendship has become. Does the hurt ever go away? I wish I could say yes, but it will get better in time. That I promise. You deceived me! Zuko's mine! On this team, I call the shots. But I've waited half my life! Batman out. Bruce is obviously trying to protect Dick from the situation, but his methods of doing so are very on character. Batman shuts Grayson out completely, which generates resentment from his sidekick. With Dick being in his late teens slash early 20s, you can believe the strife he feels when Bruce still treats him like the 10-year-old he took in. And this is definitely not the first time it's happened. There are times when I can't explain my, my actions even to you. Hey, that line worked great in sixth grade, but in case you hadn't noticed... We'll discuss this later. This hostility grows throughout the series until we see the split between the original Batman and Robin years later in the new Batman Adventures. The voice cast here is fantastic, but that's to be expected at this point. The addition of Joey Cimarron as the 10-year-old Dick Grayson provided another strong vocal performance for this episode to hang its hat on, but the most notable outsider here is the voice of Tony Zuko. You don't want my services? Okay. But you're gonna wish you listen, old man. Ah. Out of my way, punk. Sound a little familiar? Now I've got you, you lousy stick. <laughs> Bernard! I hate Bernard! It's Biff! Thomas F. Wilson lent his vocal stylings to this episode, and he makes Tony Zuko a believable sounding bully. It's pretty cool to have him here in such a high quality episode of the show. The Tony Zuko character is also shown to be a nephew of Arnold Stromwell, who was a main character in the classic episode, It's Never Too Late. This was his second and final appearance in the series. The music is handled by Carlos Rodriguez, and he did a great job at enhancing what we saw on screen. His composition that accompanied the initial flashback sequence encompasses nostalgic wonder with an undertone of sadness. His work also shines later when Grayson leaves the circus to live at Wayne Manor. The visuals in part one of Robin's Reckoning are among the most beautiful and striking the show came out with. From beginning to end, they are stunning. The shadows, the detail, the fluid movement, even for this series, it stands out as spectacular. Spectrum Animation was responsible for the look of this episode, and they went the extra mile. They were also the company behind the animation of six other episodes, including Heart of Ice, and did a lot of work on the Mask of the Phantasm movie. Unfortunately, they didn't work on part two of this story, and it shows. The most harrowing moment of the episode produced the most memorable visual. When the Graysons meet their demise, it's handled very subtly, but works to maximum effect. Holy crap. You don't ever see what happens to them on screen, but from that frayed rope swinging, the musical cue, and the crowd's reaction, it comes across even more devastating. In the audio commentary, series co-creator Bruce Timm said he was frustrated when he wasn't allowed to show more of the Grayson's fall, but it forced them to come up with something better. Originally, I think it was intended, at least on the script stage, of actually showing his parents fall to their deaths. And the BSNP people were saying, there's absolutely no, there's no way you're going to do that. It's just good fortune that it forced us to come up with a cleverer way. It's actually more effective than if you'd actually just blatantly saw his parents fall to their death. Mm -hmm. It's very emotional and very heartrending. So, you know, sometimes it's a good thing that the censors come down on us and say, no, you can't do that, because it forces you to come up with cleverer solutions. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, that's actually happened time and time again. Of the two parts, this is the one praised more by fans and critics, deservedly so. But did part two at least give us a decent conclusion to the story? I remember yes. actually even being disappointed in part two because we loved part one so much. And when we got part two back, I don't know if it was the animation or the way it was staged or if it was something inherent in the story or what. Mm. I think part one is definitely stronger than part two. We'll take a look for ourselves and I'll give you my thoughts on that subject next time. But Robin's Reckoning part one is near the top 
top of the heap in terms of quality, and if you're a big original Robin fan like I am, it's a must-see as a defining take on the character's origin. He's not gonna ace me out. Please, Master Dick, you- Not this time, Alfred. Maybe not ever again. I used to group these two episodes together when I talked about my favorite installments of the series. Upon this last rewatch, I don't think I can do that any longer. Robin's Reckoning Part 2 picks up where Part 1 left off. Against Batman's wishes, Dick Grayson is in pursuit of the resurfaced Tony Zuko, while the Dark Knight himself tracks the crook down to an abandoned amusement park. On his way to Zuko's location, Robin recalls the last time he hunted down the criminal, not long after his parents' murder. Both stories culminate in a confrontation with differing results. As much as I love Part 1, seeing Part 2 this time around left me with a sense of lost potential, disappointment, and even a bit worse than that in a few moments. The same writer, Randy Rogel, was behind both parts, but it seems like he didn't know how to end this story in a satisfactory manner. Stuff your advice, Batman! You and your stone-cold heart! The whole episode feels rushed, and the pacing failed to match the perfect balance Part 1 had. With how strong the first episode sets up Robin's vendetta against Zuko in the flashbacks and in his tiff with Batman, I was expecting a more emotional finale. I just feel like we got shortchanged in Robin's face-off with his parents' killer at the end. Batman is also uncharacteristically incompetent in this episode, spending a good portion of it limping around from being outsmarted by a character who was established as not exactly the most clever criminal the dynamic duo ever faced. The bad guys get one over on him once in a while throughout the series, but this just felt too forced. Plus, his reasoning for cutting Grayson out of Zuko's pursuit was kind of sweet, I guess, but it undercuts the tension he had with Robin in the first episode. He knew I'd take it too personally. It wasn't that, Robin. Zuko's taken so much. I couldn't stand the thought that he might... take you, too. Really? This guy? This is the guy that Batman was afraid Robin would go down to? Joker, Two-Face, Scarecrow, all those mass murderers are fine for Robin to fight, but you're afraid Bug-Eyed Biff would take out your sidekick? Come on. It would have been fine if it was just left as Batman fearing Robin would take his revenge too far. That's a perfectly fine motivation for keeping Grayson out of the situation. It's not the most original thing in the world, but don't change it just so you can have a moment where Bruce lets his emotional guard down. We've seen how much he cares about Robin in the flashbacks. Speaking of which, the flashback here is the best sequence of the episode. There's a scene where Gordon tells Bruce he might not need to watch over the young Grayson for too much longer since they may have a location on Zuko. Dick takes this opportunity to try and find Zuko himself, and some good scenes come out of it. Seeing him take that initiative at such a young age made it even more believable that he'd become Robin. Toward the end, Bruce unmasks in front of him, and the dynamic duo is born. It's too bad we didn't get to see Grayson as the young Robin all suited up here. That would have been a nice cap to the flashbacks. Supposedly, it was going to happen, but they cut it for time. While I do like what they did, that flashback could have probably been omitted to give more time to Robin going after Zuko. We didn't really need a second flashback anyway, the first one did all the work that was required. The story also may not have felt as rushed, and there could have been more drama to exploit with Batman and Robin as they clash over the gangster's fate. Despite the writing issues, the biggest problem with this episode is the animation. I hate to use this word when describing the series, but it feels a bit... lazy. Voices don't match designs, characters talk when their lips aren't moving, the motion is rigid and awkward, and the details, like Bruce's slightly younger look in the flashbacks, are dropped completely. Can't say as I have. Enough. You can't let your emotions get the best of you. This doesn't directly relate to the animation, but they even made an error in the credits, citing Dick Grayson as age 9 when he was credited as Robin, age 10, in the prior installment. It also had the unfortunate fate of following the fantastic-looking Spectrum Company animated previous episode. Part 2 was animated by the Dong Yang Company, which handled many other episodes, but I don't remember most of them looking quite this bad. 
You can't go wrong with an abandoned amusement park, so that looks decent on screen, but seeing the older Tony Zuko's eyes nearly pop out of his face every time he talks felt a bit strange. Even the timing of Thomas F. Wilson's vocal performance, actually this pretty much goes for everyone in this episode, seems off. They gave him three goons, which might be a reference to Biff's gang in Back to the Future. If so, I appreciate that little tidbit. As much as I'm railing on this one, it's important to note that it's not a bad episode. I just think they bungled the finish when part one was among the best installments of Batman the Animated Series. There was a lot to live up to, but regardless, these two should be viewed back to back for the full experience. I'm definitely curious to hear what you think of both episodes, so leave a comment below and we can all discuss it. Now, we move on from Brave Birds to Funny Fish, next time on Batman. The Laughing Fish is my favorite Joker episode of Batman the Animated Series. It's a great story that reached its peak in animated form. I'm giving you a spoiler warning here because there are a few twists that are more fun if you're seeing it for the first time. So if you haven't seen this episode, it's a Joker classic and you'll want to check it out. The Laughing Fish features a mix of humor, horrifying imagery, great music, and Batman riding a shark. It doesn't get much better. Based on and inspired by several comics, including a story of the same name in Detective Comics number 475, and even Joker's first appearance in Batman number 1, this adventure begins with fish turning up in Gotham that bear the Joker's pale white skin and demented smile. Soon, the Clown Prince of Crime makes his way to the Office of Copyrights, trying to trademark his grinning fish. When he's denied, Joker threatens to kill the patent examiner, G. Carl Francis, at midnight unless he changes his mind. That night, Batman and the Gotham PD guard Francis from outside harm, but as usual, Joker has an unpredictable plan up his sleeve. This is one of the first plots I think of when the Joker character comes to mind. An outlandish demand followed by a time-sensitive threat is something we've seen time and again with this villain. His menacing TV spots to warn Batman and or the public of his sinister intentions are a go-to tactic for the Joker. We've seen it in comics, movies, and in this very show more than once. I think what makes The Laughing Fish stand above other similar stories is that every beat is fully realized. In the TV spot, we get a jingle. As is often the case with Mark Hamill's interpretation, the Joker himself is a volatile mix of menacing and funny. Great Scott! Actually, I'm Irish. Colonel What's-His-Name has chickens, and they don't even have mustaches. You can be my very own little mermaid. <laughs> You're really sick, you know that, boss? Since my side splitters don't tickle you, how about a skull splitter? And it gets legitimately freaky when Joker's toxin begins working on his victims. <laughs> I mean, goodness gracious. Those faces have stuck with me since first seeing this episode decades ago. It was and still is a bit terrifying. The only punch they pulled was saying these two survived the Joker toxin, but if we're following the comics this episode was based on, they're dead. I'm sure the censors wouldn't let the creative team murder Francis and Jackson in such a horrific way, but it's pretty plain to see that this was meant to kill them. I love how they play the scene with Jackson since he and Batman have switched places in an attempt to deter the Joker's attack. There are clues things aren't as they seem before we're smartened up to who's who. It makes for a perfectly strange moment. <laughs> From there, Harvey Bullock heads to Gotham's Oceanside Aquarium, where he's captured by Joker and hung above a shark tank. Because after all, This fella here came with his own grin. See the resemblance? Batman soon arrives and we get the shark riding scene, which is ridiculous, amazing, and somehow still tone appropriate. Batman and Joker then meet in a classic confrontation on the roof. The setting, atmosphere, their back and forth, the music, it all works so well. Batman even gets in a backhanded bitch slap before Joker smashes his shoulder with a giant wrench from Binford Tools, which is a home improvement reference. Old Tim Allen show from the 90s, you had to be there, but that made it even funnier. Joker ends up jumping off the roof and into the ocean below, but the shark that he used earlier is seen in the water. This leads to Joker's fate being left up in the air, as was often the case, but we all knew better, and so did Batman. Do you think he's gone for good? Believe me, Jim, I wish it were true. 
but deep inside, I doubt it. There are many more details that make this episode of such high quality or at least noteworthy such as it being written by Paul Dini and directed by Bruce Timm himself, this badass shot of Batman in the Batmobile, Shirley Walker's impeccable score, its lack of a traditional title card, and more. For this, and many other reasons, The Laughing Fish is one of the most memorable installments of the series, a defining episode for the Joker, and it deserves a rewatch. Track it down, give it a view, and bask in the glory of this phenomenal, funny, fish-filled fiction. Night of the Ninja is a different kind of episode compared to what we had seen previously. The villain's grudge was directly with Bruce Wayne, which got both of our main characters' personas involved in the story. A man dressed as a ninja begins breaking into Wayne Enterprises' buildings to steal any and all cash available. This obviously gets the attention of Bruce, who recognizes a shuriken left at the Wayne Cosmetics crime scene. This leads to flashbacks that feature Bruce's initial training in the martial arts and how they may tie in to these contemporary thefts. In addition to seeing those flashbacks to Bruce's early training, Robin is once again heavily involved in the story. The tensions between the dynamic duo are stoked again, with Grayson getting annoyed at Bruce's way of doing things. Sorry, some of us aren't perfect. I'm afraid there's been another robbery of a Wayne Enterprises company. That's the sixth one in less than two weeks. Seventh. Where, Alfred? It'll only take a minute to get into my costume. Not this time, Dick. You okay? I'm fine. Come on. There's nothing more to do here. Thanks for saving my bacon, Robin. Hey, no problemo, Batman. They make up by the end, but all these moments where they butt heads stack up until Dick eventually leaves Batman and Robin behind later on. Expanding on the flashbacks we see from Japan, Bruce gets a younger design, and Kevin Conroy changed his voice a bit to match Wayne's younger appearance. Good thing I decided to practice tonight. Yoro-sensei would hate to lose that blade. This is one of those rare times we see Bruce before returning to Gotham as Batman, and I believe it was handled well. I do think it was a little weird that Alfred was apparently with him, though. Do you know anything about Bruce's training in Japan? Of course, dear boy. I was there. I always assumed Bruce went off on his own for all those years. It's a small detail, but it does make you think. However, the writing for Alfred actually does seem a little bit off in this episode. He even gets scared when Bruce walks in on he and Dick's conversation, which usually wouldn't happen. Spoilers! The ninja ends up being Bruce's rival from the Japanese dojo, a man named Kyodai Ken. Wayne got him kicked out of their training when he caught Ken stealing their sensei's ancient sword. Following his expulsion, he became a full-time thief and arrived in Gotham to get revenge on Bruce by stealing the Wayne fortune and wiring it to his own accounts. The climax sees an abducted Wayne and inquisitive reporter Summer Gleason at the mercy of Kyodai. I like this scene because Bruce begins fighting his old rival, but can't show how adept he is in front of Gleason, lest she begin to suspect he's more than just a billionaire playboy. So Bruce gets his butt kicked for a while, even receiving a black eye and swollen cheek from the vengeful ninja. Robin arrives and through some quick thinking, obstructs Gleason's view so Wayne can finally take on the man who consistently bested him all those years ago. This will make your defeat all the more satisfying. Shut up and fight. Bruce wins the battle, but Kyodai escapes through a window and is not brought to justice. He would show up again in Day of the Samurai, which we'll talk about later this month. I do like this episode. Besides Alfred being a bit off, the writing is pretty smart, and we got to see a little background on Bruce's Batman training. Having him go up against someone who we know defeated him many times when he was younger up the stakes a little bit. The Batman and Robin relationship also continued to grow and change through a few uneasy exchanges. So overall, I don't think it's an essential episode, but it is enjoyable and offers something a little different.
Cat Scratch Fever continues the story of Selena Kyle. She's really the main character for a while here, in a story that isn't her best, but pushes forward her relationship with Batman and shows off how Catwoman is viewed by the public. Following her arrest at the end of The Cat and the Claw Part 2, Selina is released on five years probation under the condition that she can never again prowl the streets as Catwoman. She returns home to find that her cat, Isis, ran away a few days before. Determined to find her, Selina roams Gotham, searching for her feline friend when she encounters two people illegally capturing strays. After an altercation that leads her to spend the night in jail, Kyle discovers that the animal collectors were represented by a lawyer from Daggett Labs. Suspicious, she investigates as Catwoman to find that they've been infecting all the strays with a toxin that turns them aggressive. Spotting Isis at the facility, she takes her out of the cage only to be bitten and infected with that toxin. Batman finds her wounded and tries to nurse her back to health while getting to the bottom of Roland Daggett's latest scheme. In the production order, this is only the second time we see Catwoman appear. That is, if you count the cat and the claw as one story. Selina did show up in Perchance to Dream, but without spoiling that one, let's just say she wasn't quite herself. Actually, a Catwoman spin-off show was proposed at one point. Whether this was a solo series or the previously mentioned team-up with Black Canary, I'm not sure, but in the book Batman Animated, we see a few revamped designs from Bruce Timm that were never used. Like all the characters, she was eventually redesigned for the new Batman Adventures, but her more detailed gray suit is the much more memorable look. In any case, I like how we see her arc progress here from her role in the events of The Cat and the Claw, as she's being judged for her actions, both positive and negative. Yes, she did help Batman stop Red Claw and her organization from releasing a deadly virus into Gotham, but Selina was a longtime thief before that. Interestingly, the people of Gotham seem to be behind her. I have decided to sentence you to five years <gasps> probation. <laughs> Selina has quite the media storm surrounding her, as this is apparently a big news story. I do like the attention to detail, as her character has to deal with the consequences of whatever she was just involved in previously. In true Catwoman fashion, she's not pegged down as a hero or a villain, although in this episode, she's clearly in the right and not shown doing anything too nefarious. And all this isn't lost on Batman. Bruce Wayne's feelings for her are obviously still there, but he knows she's in love with his alter ego. Bruce also isn't so convinced that Kyle has left Catwoman and her old criminal lifestyle in the past. It's that raw attraction but inescapable mistrust that makes their relationship so interesting. You're hot. Now you notice. Since the public knows Selina is Catwoman, this presents a bit of a different dynamic for her to play with. She can't be caught in the suit for fear of legal penalties, but she just can't help herself as Kyle slides back into her costume to look into Daggett Labs. After she's infected with the toxin, Batman takes care of her in one of her old hideaways, apparently located in Wakanda, and searches Daggett Labs himself. He finds boxes of viral antitoxins just before Roland himself shows up to explain his plan. He's infecting as many of Gotham's strays as possible to create a plague on the city. When Gothamites come down with the virus, Daggett will profit from his antitoxin and make a fortune. Strange how this is the second straight story that features Catwoman trying to stop a viral plague. The circumstances are different and make up a very disparate story, but that is a notable aspect to this episode. When Batman takes over the action, we get a fun fight in the snow with a vicious infected dog. It then spills onto ice and eventually leads to this badass moment. Guy's gotta be an ice cube by now. From there, Selina and the animals are cured, Daggett is stopped, and Isis is returned to her rightful owner. It's left unclear what Kyle's next move will be, as she doesn't show up again until the episode Tiger Tiger, which we will be talking about later, but Cat Scratch Fever is not a bad installment of the show. Again, it drives the character forward, so it's not quite a throwaway episode, but on its own, it doesn't do too much to stand out in a series filled with high-quality material. The animation is pretty inconsistent, and on the Blu-ray, this episode doesn't look nearly as well restored as most of the others. The infamous white cell dust is plainly visible for much of the first chunk. The story also isn't a masterpiece or anything, but the music by Harvey Cohen was nominated for an Emmy. Plus, we get appearances from Lucius Fox, Renee Montoya, and Mandark. Sorry, kitten. But you heard the man.
The Strange Secret of Bruce Wayne features the only appearance of Dr. Hugo Strange in Batman the Animated Series. Supposedly, a sequel was written by Michael Reeves called Mind Games, but it was never developed into an episode. While he did pop up in an installment of Justice League Unlimited, Strange probably could have been used to create a few more interesting stories considering his knowledge of Batman's identity. His sole episode in this series is a decent one though, and notable for a few of its attributes. After Batman breaks up a blackmail attempt on Judge Maria Vargas, Commissioner Gordon tells him the license plate on the blackmailer's car is registered to the Yucca Springs Resort Corporation, a subsidiary of Daggett Industries. Vargas just returned from their health resort, having gone through their stress management program under Dr. Hugo Strange. Batman investigates the resort as Bruce Wayne, hoping to gain information. While there, he attends the same program Judge Vargas did, and Doctor Strange is revealed to be turning his client's deepest secrets into recordable images through his radiopathic monitoring device. It's designed to lower the defenses of its subject, and Bruce falls victim to this. Unbeknownst to Wayne, Strange discovers his identity as Batman. The Doctor then contacts the Joker, Two-Face, and Penguin to join him at the resort and sell that knowledge to the highest bidder. Bruce and Alfred see what's going on and try to stop Strange before the man behind the bat is revealed to his greatest enemies. There's a decent amount to like about this episode. We get another interpretation of Bruce's tragic past, a unique villain to the show, some detective work on Wayne's end, and Alfred even has a sizable role in the action. Add Batman's secret identity being in jeopardy and three of his biggest adversaries into the mix, and we end up with quite a bit to discuss. The story seems to be based, at least in part, on 1977's Detective Comics number 471 and 472. That story plays out very differently, but it does show Strange finding out who Batman really is. The Hugo Strange in The Strange Secret of Bruce Wayne comes off as an old school baddie from the 1940s and 50s with his giant brain machine and mad scientist type delivery. The character was developed back then, so it only makes sense. My radiopathic monitoring device is infallible. The Doctor is a decent foe for Bruce, as he's one of the only people who successfully extracted Wayne being Batman from his strong-willed mind. The depiction of this on screen is pretty cool. It's sort of abstract and reminds me a bit of the memories rushing back to Bruce in The Forgotten. I was only a child. There was nothing I could do. A need filled you. All consuming. All controlling. What was it? I wanted... REVENGE! That's a pretty great moment, and the music elevated the visuals. Shirley Walker's animated Batman theme is still my personal favorite of all the characters' anthems. Lolita Ritmanis is actually listed as the composer here, and she did a great job. Right from the creepy title card fading in, the accompanying music is the right mix of haunting and a bit heartrending. Strange pulls a typical bad guy move and decides to contact Batman's nemeses to sell his real name for the highest price. A lot more could have been done with that idea, especially if this was a character that showed up more than once, but the execution of bringing in Joker, Two-Face, and Penguin isn't bad. I gotta say, Joker's answering machine is pitch perfect. Leave your message at the sound of the shriek. No, please, don't! Ah! Spoilers from here on out. When they're all brought together on screen, things pick up. As Bruce looks into the specifics of Strange's machine, Alfred spots the trio of villains casually entering the resort. He's eventually captured and drugged by the Doctor, giving up Wayne's plan after an apparent struggle. Your butler told us you would be here. He took a dose of sodium pentatol to persuade him to talk. He is quite loyal to you. He's apologetic, but his dedication to his surrogate son is never in doubt. This isn't the last time we see Alfred physically involved in a story, and his participation almost always makes these episodes better. As the story unfolds, Batman outsmarts Strange by using his machine to fabricate, then visualize a scenario that sees the other villains turn on him. With this machine, I can imagine Batman to be anyone I choose, and these fools will pay a fortune for it. Strange grabs some of the cash and escapes with Batman and the other rogues on his tail. This leads to a climax in an airplane where Strange tries to convince Joker, Two-Face, and Penguin that Wayne and Batman are one in the same. Two-Face's reaction is pretty great. Bruce Wayne is Batman! That's absurd. I know Bruce Wayne. If he's Batman, 
I'm the King of England. Besides it just being unbelievable that Bruce could be Batman, there's a deeper layer there. Bruce is one of the last people Harvey Dent trusted and probably still trusts on some level. If Wayne is the Dark Knight, that means Harvey's old best friend is now his greatest enemy. Dent can't even fathom the thought of that. Just a nice little touch that I really like. By the end, Batman stops all four bad guys as they're arrested, no one believing Strange's story. This culminates in a very memorable sequence. I know your secret! What secret is that? No! I asked Bruce Wayne to help me expose you, and I was glad to do it. This turns out to be Dick Grayson dressed as Bruce, mask and stilts included. Robin was seen for a couple seconds earlier in the episode, but it's still a nice little twist. Seeing Bruce and Batman on screen together always stuck out to me when I was a kid, so if for nothing else, I've never forgotten this episode because of that moment. The animation here is done by Acom Productions, so it's not the best, but they do pull off a couple really nice visuals. Also, Bruce's eyes are brown, a departure from the usual black. Honestly, I kind of like that. It helps him stand out a bit, but then again, maybe there was a little too much brown in his design already. However, I do think brown is a better fit for him than the piercing sky blue they used for his redesign in the new Batman adventures. Anyway, the strange secret of Bruce Wayne isn't an essential episode, but there's enough good stuff here to get something out of it. There are stakes involved with Batman's identity being on the line, and we get to see some of the show's best characters come together. Heart of Steel is an ambitious, sci-fi driven two-parter with clever high quality storytelling, solid animation, and strong voice acting. Part 1 introduces the problem while leaving our hero in an almost literal cliffhanger. In the production order, it's also the introduction of Barbara Gordon, the future Batgirl. Late one night, Wayne Enterprises is infiltrated by a robotic briefcase, left there earlier by a mysterious woman. It sprouts metal legs and an eyeball, then covertly makes its way into a vault to steal the highly advanced protein silicon wafer chips. Later called wetware, these prototype chips are said to be the missing link between computer and human thought. With Bruce already in the building, he discreetly changes into the Batsuit and pursues the briefcase. After losing it when it transforms into a rocket, the chips are delivered to the same woman who dropped off the robotic thief. Later, the police and Wayne discuss that the only other person working on artificial intelligence at this level is Carl Rossum, an old friend of Bruce who went into semi-seclusion after his daughter passed away. Wayne visits Rossum at the headquarters of his company, Cybertron Industries. There, he's introduced to Rossum's most pioneering project to date, Hardak, the holographic analytical reciprocating digital computer. Also there is Rossum's assistant, Randa Duane. Looking to get more information about Hardak, he invites her over for a late dinner, but things take a turn when another break-in at Wayne Enterprises is reported, and Randa is left alone at Wayne Manor. There are a lot of influences that seemed to inspire this episode. 2001 A Space Odyssey, Blade Runner, and Invasion of the Body Snatchers, just to name a few. Even Transformers gets a shout out with the name of Rossum's company. I love how this is given two parts to tell the full story, as that has it come off as a bigger scale narrative than most of the episodes prior. As for part one, it's a lot of setup, but that's not a negative at all. The pacing from scene to scene is perfect and creates an exciting cinematic flavor to the episode. There are a lot of tense moments where cross-cutting is used to showcase the stealthy actions and mysterious motivations of the antagonists. Meanwhile, Batman and anyone else on the other side are left trying to play catch-up to get to the bottom of this conundrum before it's too late. The animation for both parts was done by the Japanese studio Sunrise. It looks really good with fluid movement and a high level of detail, including heavy shadows that are needed for important parts of the story. However, this is one of the episodes on the Blu-ray release that maintains a high level of cell dirt that became a little distracting at a few points. Writer Bryn Stevens wrote six episodes across the series and handled a few big Batgirl stories later. Barbara Gordon makes her first appearance here, so her connection to that character is obvious. And the future Batgirl is more than just a cameo in this story. We get to see Commissioner Gordon introduce her and her first interaction with Bruce. Barbara, come in. You've grown. It's been, what, four years? Considering what happens later on with these two characters and this continuity, 
that's kind of gross. But at the time, it was just interesting to hear that Bruce knew Barbara well before her transformation into Batgirl. Kevin Altieri hit another home run with the direction of both parts, but for a guy with a litany of such high quality episodes to his name, that's no surprise. The voice acting and music are also great as usual, making even part one alone a complete package. Stay put? I don't think so. William Sanderson voices Carl Rossum here, and everything about his involvement in the story is a great callback to J.F. Sebastian, his character in the original Blade Runner film. Speaking of which, spoilers from here on out. As the plot becomes clearer, we see that Hardak has been making duplicates of people for a yet unknown purpose. Hardak's name, voice, and red light are a clear homage to Hal from 2001. Some people in high places are becoming too curious about this operation. They must be dealt with. The first duplicate we see emerge from his creation chamber is James Gordon. In a fantastic and creepy reveal shot, Randa and the duplicate Gordon arrive at the commissioner's home. Yes? What the devil? When the duplicate replaces Gordon, Barbara can tell something's off right away. Don't you like the roast, Dad? It's fine. That's practically all you've said since last night. When Bruce is called away from his date with Randa, she knocks out Alfred, making her the show's ultimate villain, and invades the Batcave, discovering Batman is in fact Bruce Wayne. When the Dark Knight returns and tries to access the Batcomputer, it leads to a standout moment. Computer, scan Batcave for... <laughs> We end there with Batman's own tech turning against him. He's hanging midair from a pair of robotic arms that were set up earlier in the episode. I absolutely love how this all played out. The homages and little easter eggs for sci-fi fans were the icing on the cake to a really strong first part. But does part two hold up just as well and form a high caliber complete story? Find out next time on Batman. Heart of Steel Part 2 finished off a full-on science fiction robot story that fit in well with the usually more grounded Batman the Animated Series. There's a lot of well-executed action sequences that go pretty far with the destruction of some of these duplicates. Plus, Barbara Gordon is heavily involved in saving the day, and we get this scene. Please let go of my cape. Perfection. Continuing from where part one left us, Batman is being attacked by the Hardak controlled tech in the Batcave. He's able to escape immediate danger and tries to trace the source of where the uplinked computer is located. However, Hardak cuts off its location before Batman can find it. Meanwhile, Carl Rossum attempts to shut down his creation when Hardak incapacitates him, pledging to carry out a larger scale version of his original plan. Barbara Gordon soon calls for Batman's help in her suspicion that the entity currently calling himself Jim Gordon is not actually her father. Unsatisfied with sitting on the sidelines, she decides to investigate Cybertron Industries herself, just as Bruce Wayne finds himself at the center of what Mayor Hill calls a very exclusive new club. I think the most distinct aspect to this episode is how fun killing these robots are. The production team freely admitted in the commentary that they were able to go much further than usual with the imagery shown. The simple defense was that even though they look like humans, they're just machines. The first death, showing duplicate Bullock's demise, let us know we were going to be seeing a bit more than usual. I love it. At this point in the story, we were pretty sure, but it wasn't yet confirmed that Bullock was a duplicate. So seeing Barbara cry there lent some credence to the moment. Pretty much everything else I want to talk about here goes into spoiler territory, so if you haven't seen this one and it sounds interesting, that's because it is, and you should. There are no huge twists or anything, but just in case, this is your spoiler warning. Continuing with the destruction of these duplicates, Batman cuts an elevator cable that demolishes a handful of them. They drop all the way to the basement before we see their mangled wreckage and a steel skull with a loose eyeball fall out of the open doors. 
The duplicate of Rossum himself is blown to smithereens by that powerful looking taser Randa carries around. The scream we hear there is pretty intense. Ouch! Gordon's duplicate is also blown up a second later, but we see his robot skeleton land, artificial flesh still attached to its face. Randa is dispatched sort of Terminator style with an elevator completely crushing her. The added detail of her neck tilting was especially twisted. Hardak explodes after its core systems are damaged, and these two neat looking trash can robots are taken out when Batman plants a pair of Batarangs in their heads. They were introduced when Barbara sneaks into Cybertron Industries and start off as almost Star Wars droid looking spy bots before making their transformation. The production team also made it a point for the duplicates in this episode to come off increasingly creepy. The red eyes is a classic, but having them unnaturally walk on all fours and turn their heads 360 degrees took it to the next level. My favorite shot though is probably when the damaged Marilyn Monroe inspired Randa directly attacks Batman. So good! Batman's reaction is awesome and the music plays that moment up even more. The sequence where the humans are revealed to be alive in a submersion tank also added to this episode's welcomed surreality. Plus the animation is taken up a notch from the previous installment which helped raise these moments to a higher level. Besides all the mechanical destruction, there is a bit of a brutal looking human injury when the released and already hurt Commissioner Gordon is shot in the head by a laser from that little yellow robot. This one isn't destroyed though, as Rossum shuts it down, even carrying it out of the flaming building. Seeing Barbara Gordon take an active role in the story so early on in her appearances worked to this episode's advantage. It effectively foreshadowed her role as Batgirl. A police commissioner's daughter doesn't get all her education in school. I'm getting too old for this kind of stuff. I sort of enjoyed it. A lot of this was the work of writer Bryn Stevens. In the audio commentary, director Kevin Altieri mentions how much he looked forward to working with her. Well, Bryn Stevens wrote this. What I like about her is she gave like this real female take, you know, she always liked creating like these female characters. And even though she would do science fiction, she always like did things with a lot of heart. And I thought, you know, like Bryn Stevens, Heart of Steel, when I first saw the script, I said, this is gonna be good. <laughs> the commentary also gives some interesting perspective on how much producers Bruce Tim and Eric Radomski gave their directors and storyboard artists leeway to take a few liberties with the scripts. We gave the directors and the board guys the option of going off script if they felt they really needed to, to make the show more cinematic or to restage a fight scene or whatever. Yeah. Um, we actually depended on the board guys and the directors to plus the shows whenever possible. We didn't insist that they stick exactly to you know, every word of the script. Whenever these commentary tracks are available, they always provide excellent insight on the creative process. Like the fact that the Carl Rossum character was named after the Russian play R.U.R., Rossum's Universal Robots, which introduced the term robot into science fiction and language itself. The heart, no pun intended, of this episode is a little bit underplayed. Bruce mentions in part one that Rossum's daughter died a few years prior, which sent him into seclusion. Part two has just a single line from Rossum on that subject, but later, Hardak explains his maker's motivations more clearly. The plan was conceived by Carl Rossum when his young daughter was deactivated. A vehicular accident. Afterwards, he decided to find a way to replace humans whose decisions can cost other human lives. I think this may have been a bit of a missed opportunity. There is no shortage of tragic villains in this show, but Carl Rossum isn't one of them. He created Hardak with an ill conceived intention, but he quickly righted himself when his creation was taking things out of hand. Delving more into Rossum's background with his daughter and maybe making him a tad more misguided in his pursuit of the original goal could have made for an antagonist on par with the tragic origins of Two-Face and Mr. Freeze. Instead, all those qualities are channeled into Hardak. It's different, which is why I like these episodes, but we may have gotten a more emotional story underneath the steel and wiring if they had gone down that route. Originally, a Batman duplicate was to appear in the climax, but they ran out of time. However, the production team loved the idea so much that they gave that concept its own episode called His Silicon Soul, which we'll talk about at the end of this year's Batman. If you can't tell already, this is a big time recommendation for me. Check it out for another genre that this show pulled off flawlessly.
If you're so smart, why aren't you rich? It's a question I'm sure a lot of people have asked themselves, and on this show, it was a great way to bring in one of Batman's signature villains, the Riddler. This is the 40th episode in the production order of the series, so it was about time this character was introduced. Voiced by John Glover, he only shows up in a handful of stories, a shame because whenever he did pop up, it usually made for a pretty good episode, as is the case here. Edward Nigma is the very intelligent creator of a popular video game called The Riddle of the Minotaur. He arrives at work one morning to find out his boss, Daniel Mockridge, has fired him, and since he created the game while under the company's employ, he has no rights to the money made from it. While arguing with Mockridge, he's posed with the question, If you're so smart, why aren't you rich? We cut to two years later, as Mockridge is attempting to sell assets related to the game to Wayne Enterprises. A riddle pops up in the background that freaks him out, and later, Mockridge is confronted by Nigma in his office. Now calling himself the Riddler, Nigma tries to enact twisted revenge on his former employer, but Batman and Robin intervene. This leads to a life-size version of Nigma's game where the dynamic duo have to solve riddles and avoid deadly traps to save Mockridge in the center of a maze. This episode was one of three directed by series co-creator Eric Radomski. He directed two other classics that we'll get to later this month. The Riddler's introduction to the series was written by David Wise, whose other writing credits on the show were The Clock King and The Strange Secret of Bruce Wayne. I can definitely see a connection in the tone of all three of those episodes, especially with The Clock King story. While the Riddler is one of Batman's most recognizable arch nemeses, he really didn't show up all that much in the show. The production team was well aware of this, and in the book Batman Animated, the reasoning is laid out in some detail. Quote, a constant frustration to Batman as well as our writing staff, the quizzical Edward Nigma, better known as the Riddler, earned the dubious honor of being our series' most difficult villain. There are at least a half dozen full or partially completed Riddler stories in our dead script file that proved ultimately too complex or too silly to produce. In a comic book, mystery novel, or live action drama, the writer has the luxury of time to set up and solve a brain racking crime. In a 22 minute cartoon, the action has to keep moving and gimmick heavy characters like the Riddler have to make their point quickly and get on with it." End quote. I wonder how many of those dead stories were two-parters. That would have likely given them time to tell a proper, complex Riddler story, but I guess we'll never know. John Glover's voice was the perfect fit for this character, and I think that's apparent throughout the episode. Nigma presents a very cerebral persona, and his superiority complex is evident in every line he reads. You know what happens to gate crashers? They have to match wits with the Riddler. That is one of the best reveal shots in the series. I absolutely love how that looks, and with the line delivery, it shows off just how much more serious this version of the character is compared to past interpretations. The design for his costume fits the show great too. This wasn't the first time we saw the green suit and bowler derby used for the character, but it is a bit stripped down here. Only one question mark adorns the Riddler's tie while he maintains his signature staff. There was an early design for the character that featured his original green leotard, but I don't think it would have matched with the tone of this show. However, that didn't stop them from using it later in possibly the worst character redesign for the new Batman adventures. Batman and Robin are in peak dynamic duo form here. I really like how they play off each other to solve the riddles and get through the maze. It shows off how they need to rely on each other sometimes, and I love seeing them figure things out. The design and execution of the maze in the story was really well done, and a big fun obstacle to see our heroes travel through. Loses a head. I don't know what's worse, the traps or the puns. This was also memorably adapted in the Super Nintendo game The Adventures of Batman and Robin. Funnily enough, they use a few Super Mario sound effects when Dick's playing the riddle of the Minotaur game in the Batcave. But you've got to solve all these riddles. There's a point where Kevin Conroy voices Bruce's lighter tone and Batman's deeper register back to back. I love when we get to hear that because it shows off just how different those personas were in this era of the show. Why do multi-million dollar deals break down in the wasteland? Of course, any Riddler story isn't complete without the Bat family figuring out the villain's real name. His name's Nigma, Edward Nigma. I get it. Enigma. Mr. Enigma. 
Edward Nigma. Spoilers here. After a solid climax, Riddler escapes, which I like. With him still on the loose months later, we see Mockridge, rich after the deal he made with Wayne Enterprises, still scared of the repercussions of firing Nigma two years prior and profiting off his work. How much is a good night's sleep worth? Now there's a riddle for you. Overall, I really enjoyed this episode. If you think the Riddler is just a goofy, lame, secondary villain, check this one out, and it may change your mind. Joker's Wild had an all-star team behind it. With Paul Dini writing, the late great Boyd Kirkland directing, and Joker starring as the main villain, you'd think this would be one of the greats. But as is, it's just alright. There are some really fun ideas and concepts that were unfortunately bogged down a bit by the poor animation. Also, Ernie Hudson voices a character in this? On the outskirts of Gotham City, real estate tycoon Cameron Kaiser unveils a $300 million casino called Joker's Wild. Many are surprised to see that much of the decor directly resembles the infamous criminal who's currently locked up in Arkham Asylum. Kaiser denies this, saying it's a classic symbol, not meant to invoke the real-life madman. Joker sees the grand opening on TV and quickly causes enough chaos to escape his prison, with the intention of destroying the casino and its owner for cashing in on his likeness. Bruce Wayne was present at the grand opening and discovers the Joker theme wasn't the original look of the gambling paradise. As he investigates Kaiser, Joker shows up at the location, blending in as a car dealer. With the Dark Knight and the Clown Prince of Crime on a collision course, the truth behind Kaiser's Joker-themed decor is revealed. The basic idea of this episode I really like. Having a casino built in Joker's likeness with everything inside featuring his face creates a fertile ground for hijinks and characteristic action sequences. And that part of the story is executed pretty well. I like that there's more of a reason for a giant Joker roulette wheel. It's smart. His escape from Arkham? A bit less so. One of Kaiser's henchmen, Irving, is posing as a prison guard in order to let Joker out without letting the clown know. That's all well and good, but it leads to Joker just walking out of an unlocked door. Sure, he tripped up a couple of the orderlies and made it over the fence by swinging onto a truck, but there's not at least a lock for him to get past? The alarm doesn't even go off until Joker walks through the exit. I'm sure Irving set a few things up, but I don't know, this just seemed a little too easy. What I do know is that this security guard shown later is voiced by Ernie Hudson. Mr. Kaiser, that dealer's doing something screwy. I'm calling security. Love that guy. Small stuff aside, the biggest issue with this episode is the weak animation. I've talked about Acom Animation Company before, but they were pretty bad here. Bruce's brown eyes are back, and several of the in theory really fun action sequences suffer from the subpar movement. In one of the only substantial changes I'm aware of on the Blu-ray, the sign Joker holds up when getting into his car reads, Win the Original. When it first aired up through the DVD release, it read this. Bruce Tim was said to be upset with the constant subpar efforts and would soon stop using the company altogether a few episodes later. Despite these flaws, I still enjoy Joker's Wild. My favorite scene showcases a game of blackjack between Joker, posing as a car dealer, and Bruce Wayne himself. There's a really snippy back and forth between the two as Bruce is clearly messing with his greatest enemy. Don't care for the decor? I'd be ready for the Laughing Academy if I had to stare at that ugly clown all day. Wayne proceeds to beat him while continuing to underhandedly insult him. It's pretty awesome. After confirming his identity, Bruce changes into his Batman gear and the action picks up, leading to that Joker mobile chase, which is still entertaining regardless of the shoddy animation. Mark Hamill is as good as ever here. I love the through line of references to the Looney Tunes as the episode goes along. Dialogue, noises, and even an appearance from Bugs Bunny himself make it fun. On top of that, his Three Stooges curly singing is always appreciated. <laughs> Spoilers for the ending here. Nothing big, but this is your warning, just in case. Kaiser changed the theme of his casino to draw the Joker out in hopes he'd destroy it. With Kaiser bankrupt, he'd collect the insurance money and get back on track. But Batman leaks that info to Joker, who decides to target Cameron directly. Batman escapes the giant roulette wheel and pursues them in a helicopter climax, after which Kaiser is taken in and Joker is sent back to Arkham, where Poison Ivy, Scarecrow, and the Mad Hatter give him grief. Ultimately, Joker's Wild is a mixed bag for me. 
I don't think it's one of the best Joker episodes in the series, but it's not bad. The setting and fun ideas mostly outshine any shortcomings. But don't take my word for it. Take a gamble and check it out for yourself. Tiger Tiger takes a big swing into the science fiction body horror genre. The very obvious influence of H.G. Wells' 1896 novel The Island of Dr. Moreau makes it easy to see what the writers and director were going for. It's not like this series hasn't delved into similar concepts before, but is Tiger Tiger executed well enough to fit in among the best of the show's more odd entries? While visiting the zoo, Selena Kyle is shot with a tranquilizer dart and abducted by an ape-human hybrid. She's taken to an island inhabited by feline mutants created by the obsessed Dr. Emile Dorian. By the time Batman tracks her down, Dorian has turned her into a cat-human hybrid. However, the doctor's greatest creation is the dominant Tigress, another feline-human experiment. Selena Kyle's new form is meant to be the perfect mate for Tigress, but when Batman interferes, he's chased into the forests of the island as prey for Dorian's supposed ultimate life form. Meanwhile, the now literal Catwoman tries to escape the doctor's final mutagen dose that will make her transformation permanent. This wasn't the first or last time Batman the Animated Series went into human-animal hybrid territory. The show's first episode, On Leather Wings, did the same thing. Kirk Langstrom, who transformed into Man-Bat in that episode, even helps Batman by pointing him in the direction of Dr. Dorian's island. However, the tone and setting are very different. The island, while a nice reference to the Wells story, doesn't pack much of a punch. Things move a bit too slowly once Batman gets there, and it feels like we could have used more of Dorian's abominations running around to establish the unsettling mood. The draw of this episode is the twisted irony of Catwoman's situation, but this plays out less like a classic horror movie, as in On Leather Wings, and more like a muted attempt at showcasing the perversion of nature. I'm just not sure there was a way to portray this type of story effectively within the confines of the series. There are methods that episodes like Feet of Clay pulled off showing horrific scenes without actually showing them, but that ingenuity and cleverness is absent here. The animation is solid, yet aside from a few shots, the images do little to evoke a strong enough sense of mystery. The Tigress character is supposed to be this tragic figure by the end of the episode, but that falls a little flat. Maybe if his background was fleshed out more, or he had originally been a human with a relatable backstory, it could have drawn me in more. But as is, he's just sort of there as a conduit to show off how nature is fighting back against the immorality of Dr. Dorian. It also would have been nice to get more of the narrative from Selena's perspective. She's usually very active in her stories, but feels a little underutilized here. The voice cast is pretty good. While Adrian Barbeau isn't given too much to work with as Catwoman, Joseph Maher does very well as the nonchalantly depraved Dr. Dorian. I love cats. Their independence, their power, and beauty. That is why I've chosen you for my next experiment, Selina Kyle. Or perhaps I should say, Catwoman. The very well-known Jim Cummings actually voices multiple characters in this episode. He provides the distorted words of Tigress. Would that be so bad? You could stay here with me. The very familiar sounding Garth, the ape man. I wasn't sent here after the tiger lady. And the zoo security guard from the beginning of the episode. If you hadn't have gotten here, I would have been sushi. That tiger was ready to- Yes, sir. Cummings had a very short part in Be a Clown and would show up again in House and Garden, but those seem to be his only appearances on the show. I understand the appeal of a story that depicts Catwoman actually becoming a cat, but in this context, it didn't work very well. There's just something missing that made other similar-ish episodes reach their potential, and I believe the tone has a lot to do with that. I don't think I'd categorize it as a bad episode, however, it's not one I would recommend rushing to rewatch, although I'm sure it has its fans. It's also back to back with another human animal episode in Moon of the Wolf, which we'll cover next time. Until then, I leave you with Batman reading aloud a poem, The Tiger by William Blake. Enjoy the selection. Tiger, tiger, burning bright, in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye Dare frame thy fearful symmetry.
After watching Tiger Tiger directly before this, it's easy to say Moon of the Wolf is this kind of episode done right. Based on the comic, the elements of a good werewolf story are present. A sympathetic but intimidating villain, a returning mad scientist, some gnarly distinctive music, Batman doing the detective work, and a strong finale made sure this episode hit all the right notes. When a Gotham Zoo security guard named John Hamner is attacked in the park by an apparent werewolf, Batman steps in to stop the assault. The Dark Knight thinks this is just a man in a mask as the monstrous figure escapes the incident. However, clues about two Alaskan Timberwolves recently turning up missing at the zoo and the real wolf hairs left on Batman's suit lead the caped crusader to start thinking there's a more supernatural explanation at play. Before he can investigate further, he's invited to the home of Gotham star athlete Anthony Romulus to accept a donation for a charity fund. While there, things start to get a bit hairy. Moon of the Wolf was the title of Batman number 255 from 1974. It featured art by the legendary Neil Adams and was written by this episode's scribe, the late great Len Wein. Wein is very well known in the comic community for his many contributions to the art form. Some of his notable achievements include co-creating Swamp Thing, Lucius Fox, Amanda Waller, Nightcrawler, Colossus, Storm, Wolverine, and many more. He was also the editor for the landmark DC classic, Watchmen. There were very few differences from the comic to this episode, and it's no wonder why. This one translated seamlessly. The more supernatural stuff didn't always fit in best with the show, but when they tried to recreate a specific genre, it usually worked out well. Moon of the Wolf is a great example of that. Tying in the return and final appearance until Justice League Unlimited of Professor Achilles Milo was also a nice touch since he was set up in Cat Scratch Fever. His backstory with Anthony Romulus is very believable and made this turn into werewolf territory more than just a gimmick. Romulus himself isn't really shown to be too bad of a guy. A cheater, yes, but not quite deserving of the fate he's stuck with. After seeking out and receiving an experimental steroid from Milo, he gains an upper hand against his competition at Gotham's Autumn Games. But after he stops working with the professor, he starts experiencing the first stages of what would later become a much bigger problem. What you're suffering from, my friend, is an early stage of lycanthropy, werewolfism. <laughs> What's a little odd about this situation is that Milo says there's no treating the mild form of the disease, but there is a cure for advanced werewolfism. Romulus reluctantly buys this information and takes another dose of the professor's concoction, transforming him completely. From there, Milo holds the antidote over Romulus's head until he does exactly what he says. It's pretty darn gullible, even for a story with a werewolf in it, for a character to voluntarily make his condition worse so it can be cured. But then again, it's not like Romulus had many other options. When the werewolf is on screen, it's quite awesome. He's a more than formidable foe for Batman, and Acom Productions did a good job animating him. The transformation sequences harken back to the early Wolfman movies and add to the character's horrific quality. Frank Welker went uncredited here, but actually provided the wolf sounds for the episode. When all that's combined with the primal music provided for the character by Richard Bronskill, it makes for a really well done complete package. His battles with Batman across the episode feel like our hero is actually in danger, and any villain that can make a more credible opponent for Bruce is always appreciated. Spoilers for the ending, just in case. It's not anything huge, but since I am recommending this episode for rewatch, this is your warning. Batman ends up outsmarting the werewolf by hitting him with a wrecking ball, but nature takes over when it's also struck by lightning, sending Romulus into the water below. He's shown at the end to apparently survive the incident, but is never heard from again. Milo is also arrested for his role in the madness. Honestly, I think they could have easily brought this character back for a wrap-up to the story. He's a strong enough antagonist to where another script featuring him could have worked. Maybe it would have showcased a revenge plot against Milo with Batman stuck in the middle, or even a chance at redemption. But in any case, it works just fine as a single episode, and it's one you should definitely go back and see as something a little different for the series. <laughs> Day 
Day of the Samurai is a sequel to Night of the Ninja from earlier this season. It was written by Steve Perry and directed by series co-creator Bruce Timm. It's one of the more sophisticated episodes I've reviewed so far with plenty of subtitles for the Japanese language scenes, the legend of an ancient fighting technique, and a climactic battle on the side of a volcano. On paper, this episode probably looked great. However, the extremely poor animation by Blue Pencil SI pretty much sunk the ship for me on this last rewatch. After being defeated by his old rival Bruce Wayne in Gotham City, Kyodai Ken pops back up at his former sensei's dojo in Japan to kidnap his new prize student, Kyai. In exchange for her safe return, Kyodai wants the location of an ancient scroll that contains instructions for a deadly fighting technique, considered centuries earlier too dangerous to be taught. Yoru-sensei decides to call in Bruce Wayne, hoping his friend Batman would be able to help the situation. Bruce and Alfred then fly to Japan as the Dark Knight tries to secure Kyai's safe passage home while also attempting to stop Kyodai from finding the deadly martial arts knowledge. There's no real way to ignore this. Day of the Samurai is one of the worst looking episodes of the series. The inconsistent and unrelenting awkward movement was ridiculously distracting. And it's not even just the movement. The layers are off with characters stepping over foreground elements, and this shot here of the background not changing as we cut to another angle made me double take. It's such an obvious blunder. It's like they thought slightly zooming out would make the shot look different enough, but it actually makes it worse. It's a shame because Bruce Timm was clearly trying to tell this epic story here, and a lot of the shots reflect that, but the execution really did this episode a massive disservice. The story by Steve Perry, who also wrote Night of the Ninja, Mudslide, and more, was pretty decent, but I think a lot of it was reliant on the visuals and atmosphere, both of which are subpar. The music by Carlos Rodriguez is fine, but it doesn't quite lift this episode up like a lot of the other scores from lesser installments do. And the voice acting, while there's nothing wrong with the delivery, sometimes comes across as stilted because of how everything is paced. Blue Pencil SI only animated one other episode, that being the Riddler's debut in If You're So Smart, Why Aren't You Rich? I don't remember that episode looking so poor. I'm not sure what happened here, but they weren't used again, so I'm guessing the production team was unhappy with their work. I don't mean to be too hard on the looks of the show, but when you jump from an episode that is of such high quality to this, it's a bit jarring. The concept for this episode is a memorable one, the mythical one-touch kill. Yoru-sensei's great-great-great-grandfather created the technique, and when he deemed it unsuitable to be taught, stashed the instructions in a secret location. Only the eldest son of each ancestor knew where it was hidden, and with Yoru not bearing any sons, the secret was to die with him. Eventually, Bruce secures Kyai's return, and Kyodai receives the location of the instructions. They're discovered behind a rock in the cave of a volcano. The brittle paper disintegrates upon a touch, but the piece describing the one-hit kill remains intact. After Kyodai kidnaps Alfred, Batman confronts his old enemy on the side of that same volcano, now readying for an eruption. Because of his fighting style, Kyodai figured out Bruce and Batman were one and the same following their last confrontation in Gotham. Bruce unmasks and they duke it out once and for all. Eventually, Kyodai lands the one-touch kill, but after feigning death, Bruce rises and the battle continues. Kyodai then becomes isolated on a rock with lava flowing around it. After refusing Bruce's help, an explosion seemingly ends Kyodai for good. He never showed up again, but Yoru's prized student, Kyai, does make an appearance in Batman Beyond. Bruce later reveals to Alfred that he knew where the death blow spot was thanks to a visit to Ken's hideout. A dummy he had strung up was worn out particularly in one specific spot. Wayne wore a pad to block that part of his body. I will say, I remember this episode quite vividly from when I was a kid. Just something about the one-touch kill, Batman being active in Japan, and the final fight on the volcano continues to stick out in my memory. Through more modern eyes, the flaws are very apparent, but that doesn't mean the episode has no redeeming qualities. All in all, I don't think this one is worth re-watching, but if you remember it as well as I do, you might enjoy the trip down memory lane. I feel like there was a really good episode beneath the surface on this one, and it just didn't come close to its potential. Similar type episodes come up soon where Batman travels the world to fight a foreign equal, and they're much better than this. So check back for those later this month.
Terror in the Sky is a direct sequel to the show's first episode, On Leather Wings. It features the third appearance of Kirk Langstrom and the return of the Man Bat. Well, sort of. This installment of the series is based on a comic storyline from the early 1970s, and several aspects of it were changed in the adaptation from print to screen. The Man Bat is back. Attacking cargo ships at the docks and eating their crated fruit, it gets the attention of the police and, in turn, the Dark Knight himself. Batman thinks Kirk Langstrom is to blame once again for these new reports and confronts him at his lab. Langstrom has suspected himself as well, but has no memory of his new transformations. He bounces the blame back at Batman for his antidote apparently not working, as he's been trying to create one himself. Batman then takes a DNA sample to test, hoping to see what the truth of the matter actually is. Later, he has a run with the creature and compares its DNA with Langstrom's. When they don't match, it leads Batman to ask who or what this new bat creature really is. As mentioned earlier, Terror in the Sky was based on a comic book storyline in Detective Comics number 429 titled Man Bat Over Vegas. The 1972 issue was written, penciled, and inked by Man Bat co-creator Frank Robbins. This episode doesn't take place in Las Vegas, but it does seemingly stick to the basics of that original story. Bringing the Man Bat character back was a welcomed choice from the production team. Unfortunately, this was the last appearance of some version of that character in this series. Kirk Langstrom's scene in Tiger Tiger could lead one to believe he'd be a regular ally of Batman when dealing with human-animal hybrids, but that didn't turn out to be the case. This would be his final depiction on the show until a little background cameo in Chemistry, an episode of the new Batman Adventures. Although, his legacy did live on past this. His research is used in the Justice League Unlimited episode, The Doomsday Sanction, and there's a nice little tribute to Man Bat's first appearance in On Leather Wings in the JLU episode, Epilogue. This one does have a bit of a reveal for who the new Bat creature is, so this is your spoiler warning in case you want to check it out for yourself. Dr. March, Langstrom's father-in-law, has recently recreated the Bat Mutagen. He says he's been working in secret to refine it. I still believe only a creature like a man bat can survive the next evolutionary cataclysm. While interrogating him as a suspect, Batman discovers March never took the mutagen himself, but his daughter, Francine, was accidentally infected when cleaning up a shattered beaker containing the new serum. Since Man Bat's reappearance, she thinks Kirk has fallen back into old habits and leaves him. After Batman cleared his name, Kirk chased after her and was able to get on the same flight she was leaving town on. He tells her of Batman's news that there's proof he's not the re-emerged Man Bat, but soon, Francine starts feeling ill and transforms into the Bat creature while enclosed in the plane thousands of feet in the air. She forces an escape that puts the other passengers' lives in danger until Batman shows up in the Bat plane to reseal the door. The transformed Francine abducts Kirk and flies above Gotham with the Dark Knight in pursuit. This leads to Batman shooting her with the antidote, and she eventually transforms back into her normal state. Disoriented, she falls off the bridge tower they're on, but is saved by Kirk as Batman helps her back on the platform. The couple embraces as the episode wraps up. I like the twist of Francine being the unwilling villain of this story. Her relationship with Kirk honestly ends up being pretty sweet as we see them go through another crisis together. I just found myself rooting for them as the episode progressed. Kirk being the one to save Francine from falling in the climax was a really nice moment too. Building on the background of On Leather Wings as our setup, this all played out believably and made for a decent episode. It's not really on the level of On Leather Wings, and the transformation effects were done much better in other episodes, but this wasn't a bad follow-up. There's not much more to say about it. It's far from an essential episode, but if you were invested in the Man Bat's first appearance, you'll probably get something out of this sequel. As for the next installment of this series, I'll likely have a little more to say. See you then. The nightmare's finally over. Plenty has been said on this channel about Almost Got Him, and for good reason. 
It's a fun, visually engaging ensemble piece full of quips, gags, unique action, and most of our favorite characters from the series. This episode is distinct in structure while never making its multiple story format a contrivance. There's also an overarching narrative at play that reveals itself as this tale progresses. In short, it's a darn good episode. Some of Batman's greatest villains gather at a nightclub to gamble and share a few stories, those stories being of the time each one of them almost got the Dark Knight. Poison Ivy, Two-Face, Killer Croc, Penguin, and the Joker regale each other with their individual tales, the argument being who came the closest to actually defeating the Caped Crusader. Right off the bat, I'm suggesting this for a watch or rewatch. It's that great. I'll be going into spoilers toward the end, but I think it's important that you see this episode if you haven't before hearing any more of my thoughts. Just pause here, go check it out, and come back. As of the posting of this video, it's streaming on HBO Max, and there are other ways you can check it out if you don't have an account on there. There's a big reveal that definitely shapes how you view the story the first time through, and I don't want you to miss out on that experience if you've never watched the episode. Final warning, go watch it if you haven't, then join me back here. Okay? Alright, here we go. I think the best way to tackle Almost Got Him is segment by segment, so let's start with the aesthetics of the nightclub. A deliberate choice was made to have the background less detailed, and it really succeeds in making the villains and foreground elements pop off the screen. The shadows in the background even have a pretty funny bit where Killer Croc forcibly takes a chair. This look was attributed to the Flasher Superman cartoons, as explained in the commentary by writer Paul Dini, director slash co-creator Eric Radomski, and co-creator Bruce Timm. To me, it harkens back to what they did with the Fleischer Superman cartoons. There was this one where Superman goes into a room and there's a gangster sitting there in a circle of light at a right. desk. You never see anything else in, in the room. It just gives you this nice claustrophobic, you know, atmospheric feeling, mm. and that, that comes across here, too. They definitely had some top talent involved, with Dini, Radomski, and more handling this episode, so we shouldn't be surprised it's of such high quality. The small details that are slipped in when we see these familiar characters playing cards are pretty clever. Two-Face always has twos or two-face cards in his poker hand, Joker is of course constantly cheating in multiple different ways, so on and so forth. After her dramatic entrance, Poison Ivy and Two-Face have a pretty funny little exchange, as this is the first time they've interacted since being romantically linked in Pretty Poison. Half of me wants to strangle you. And what does the other half want? To hit you with a truck. We used to date. Ah. ah. Love it. She's the first to share an almost got him story as we see it play out in flashback. It was Halloween, as Ivy rigged hundreds of pumpkins to emit her special poison when they were ignited. Batman traced her back to a pumpkin patch where she bombards him with exploding jack-o'-lanterns. The Dark Knight is able to stop her with the Batmobile and put on a gas mask before Ivy could win the day. This segment looks great. The red sky background and pumpkin patch setting was a striking set piece. The same area could have even fit a scarecrow finale too. I like the setup Ivy described where most of the city was suffering the effects of her poison before Batman showed up here. Sounds like it would have made for a pretty good episode. Originally, Paul Dini wrote this to take place at Christmas time, but broadcast standards and practices apparently had an issue with that she was setting Christmas trees on fire oh, as a protest nice. against cutting down Christmas trees. So we, we made it Halloween pumpkins instead. And it's better. Next up is Two-Face's story, which also includes the origin for the giant penny in the Batcave. Batman is captured by the two-ton gang and brought to Harvey. He takes Batman's utility belt and ties him to the giant penny that adorns the Gotham Mint. He planned on flipping the massive coin to either kill Batman or seriously injure him. What Dent didn't realize is that Bruce was able to swipe his jagged silver dollar and cut himself free as the penny was flipping in mid-air. Batman then takes out Two-Face and his goons, handing Harvey his coin back in the process. This is a really well done scene all around. When the penny is flipped into the air, we get some fantastic animation coupled with some glorious music from Stuart Balcom. I absolutely adore that moment. What follows is kind of funny, as the penny flips toward a few of the henchmen and, well, listen. They gotta be dead. Not Batman's fault, but they gotta be dead. So, Harvey, what became of the giant penny? 
They actually let him keep it. After cleaning the blood off it. That scene and more available exclusively in the Snyder Cut of this episode. Next was Croc, who simply threw a rock at him. It was a big rock. That little moment still makes me laugh. The timing is perfect. Penguin then went on to tell his story of leading Batman to his aviary of doom. He sprayed bats with a cloud of mist that was derived from the nectar a certain breed of hummingbirds feed on. Penguin releases them and their poisoned beaks threaten the Dark Knight's life. When he's able to stop them from flying by striking the sprinkler system, Batman is attacked by a cassowary and cut on his arm before he can inject himself with a poison antidote. In a pretty odd moment, Batman stabs the cassowary with one of the hummingbirds as it runs away. He injects himself with the antidote just before Penguin sets off an explosive to cover his escape. This one was pretty good. Not my favorite of the bunch, but it featured an interesting location and a unique plan from Penguin. How Batman is able to defeat the birds in this scene is not something I would have expected. Stabbing the cassowary with one of the hummingbirds was definitely resourceful, but it is a little weird to see Batman shanking a large bird with a smaller bird. Last but not least was the Joker story. It turned out to be surprisingly recent, happening just the night before. He had taken over Late Night Gotham Live as it aired on TV. Everyone was kept at gunpoint by his guards, including the guests and audience. Batman is shown to be strapped to an electric chair powered by laughter, and when Joker leaks his laughing gas into the crowd, their chuckles make Bruce's pain worse. Just before it's too late, he's saved by Catwoman, who follows Joker, trying to take him in. However, she's knocked out by Harley and taken with, as Joker and Quinn escape. This is probably the best of the segments shown, since it definitely had the most detail. It isn't the first time we've seen Joker pop up on a talk show, and it definitely wouldn't be the last. There are a lot of Johnny Carson era references that may be lost on younger viewers, but I think it's generic enough to where anybody could get the general gist of what they were parodying. The black and white presentation helps it stand out, and the laughing gas leaked into the audience gave me some Dark Knight Returns vibes. It didn't go quite that far though, as Paul Dini explains in the commentary. I so. seem to recall them saying, make sure the crowd is not too tortured. You know, so the crowd's in silhouette and they're nice. being affected by the gas and mm -hmm, they're just mm -hmm. giggling their heads off. From here, we get into major spoiler territory. So if you're still viewing this video and you have yet to watch the episode, this is your last, last chance to check out the big twist for yourself. After Joker's story, he reveals to the group that Catwoman is being held at the Pussykins Pet Food Factory. That's where the big moment happens. First thing tomorrow, I'm sending a lovely case of cat food to Batman. I don't think so. <gasps> what a brilliant sequence. The lead up, music, and especially the shot of Batman's silhouette as the light moves above him make this moment one of the best in the series. The highly talented Glenn Murakami came up with a visualization of Batman and Croc's shadow as he's heavily praised for in the commentary. Murakami would go on to be a major force for DC animated projects. His credits include being the art director for Superman the Animated Series, an Emmy award winning producer for Batman Beyond, producing Teen Titans, and more. The twists keep on coming from here, as just when it seems Batman has bitten off more than he can chew... You're not getting out of this one. Maybe. But I'm not bad with traps myself. So good! What a great one-two punch. I'm sure this wasn't intentional, but this part always reminds me of the ending to the climax from the Blues Brothers. Just another reason to love this episode. The story keeps going as Batman arrives at the pet food factory to see Catwoman about to be minced into meat by Harley Quinn. He intervenes in time to stop the blades and KO Quinn before having a final scene with Catwoman on the roof. Maybe we'd have a place for each other without Gotham. Maybe without masks. Maybe. Batman does his trademark disappearance before Selina turns around and the episode ends there as she looks on at him, swinging away into the night.
It goes without saying that Almost Got Him is one of the most memorable and well-executed episodes of the show's run. Its visuals, variants of story, collection of characters, terrific voice acting, and tremendous music make this a must-see installment. Even the voiceover session sounded like a good time. We had all the principal villains, with the exception of Adrian Barbeau, and it was kind of a special day. Everybody came dressed up because we did a photo shoot that day, and there are a lot of good shots of Mark and Arlene doing their lines together. Mark would always stand up and really emote when he was doing the Joker, so we have a lot of shots of him making these funny faces, and I think it was the only time we ever had the major villains all sitting down together in, in a cast. It was a lot of fun. You can watch it multiple times and still get something out of it. Knowing Batman is Croc throughout most of the episode makes for an amusing experience the second, third, or fourth time around. If you haven't seen this in a few years, give it another watch. You just may notice a detail you didn't before. This is a complete package that stands the test of time, so revisit it if you ever feel the need. You won't be disappointed. Hmm, almost got him. Birds of a Feather does a pretty good job of humanizing the Penguin character. His seemingly sincere attempt at reform is the focus of the episode, and I'd say it's one of the better stories in the series that featured Oswald Chesterfield Cobblepot. There are some allusions to Batman Returns in both the visuals and themes that made it a nice companion piece to the villain's portrayal in that movie as well. After serving his latest sentence in prison, Penguin is determined to be a good little bird and change his criminal ways. Batman makes it clear he's watching him closely as Oswald gets involved with Gotham socialite Veronica Vreeland. Vreeland and her fellow Blue Blood Pierce are looking to increase their status among the city's elite and concoct a plan to invite Penguin to Veronica's next party. Veronica starts dating Cobblepot in public to gain his trust with the aim of making a fool of him at her big gathering. All the while, Penguin is genuinely making an attempt at reform as he mingles with the upper class and romantically falls for Vreeland. This episode was directed by Frank Parr, who helmed a ton of others across the series, ranging from Tiger Tiger to A Bullet for Bullock. This also wasn't the first time he directed a Penguin story. He has the credit for I've Got Batman in My Basement, which has gotten shellacked over the years, but I actually didn't mind all that much. This definitely takes a deeper step into the Penguin character, though. The story was written by the late Chuck Menville, and the teleplay was penned by Bryn Stevens. Stevens is responsible for a few other memorable scripts, including both parts of Heart of Steel and Batgirl's introduction in Shadow of the Bat, parts 1 and 2. This was also the last piece written for television by the prolific Menville, as he passed away before this episode aired. I really like the concept behind Birds of a Feather. Seeing Penguin trying his best to stop his dastardly habits in favor of joining Gotham's elite is a theme that works well here. We're following him through most of the episode as the sympathy builds up. He's being taken advantage of by Veronica and is constantly mocked behind his back. Even Batman has a tough time believing Cobblepot's turned over a new leaf. There's a scene where Penguin defends Veronica from a group of muggers, and the Dark Knight jumps into the fray, thinking Penguin was leading them. This contributes to Veronica's conscience rearing its head as she starts to feel sorry for Oswald. He legitimately defended her, and while she may not like everything about him, she starts to realize he isn't all bad, and maybe more than just a flamboyant criminal. Unlike many of Batman's villains, the Penguin isn't really insane. He's never sent to Arkham or anything like that, but he does have a severe inferiority complex that he makes up for by his vocabulary and self-described impeccable taste. Penguin's physical deformities are rarely focused on by this series, but in this episode, he is shown to be ridiculed for them by Pierce and his friends. While he may have given in to his bad impulses eventually, Cobblepot might have left his criminal past behind him if he was given a fair shake at a second chance. That's sort of the underplayed tragedy of this story. It's not nearly as emotional as other episodes with empathetic antagonists, and I do think they could have gone even further in that area here, but it is successful at portraying a character we've seen multiple times at this point to have a deeper layer. Please, Oswald, if it's money you want, I can get you more. Shut up! All I wanted from you, dearie, was a little friendship. That would have cost you nothing. 
This is a part of Penguin's character arc in Batman Returns. Max Schreck tries to bring him back into high society after his parents attempted to kill him off as an infant. There's obviously more to the story, but Veronica and Pierce are in the Max position in Birds of a Feather. However, Penguin isn't trying to kill any kids in this episode, so it's a tad easier to root for. The comparisons don't end there, though. Penguin's design was modeled after the Danny DeVito version in Returns, and we even see the big yellow duck show up here. Cobblepot using the sewers as his means of taking revenge also points to more aesthetic similarities. Veronica Vreeland makes her first appearance, and she's an interesting character. She's not quite as vain as most of her peers, and is someone Bruce obviously cares for. They run in the same social circles, and we get to see them interact multiple times across the series. She later has run-ins with the likes of Catwoman, the Mad Hatter, Harley Quinn, and more. Just about anyone could see where this story was going, but predictability doesn't drag Birds of a Feather down. Like I mentioned, they could have made Penguin even more sympathetic, and I really missed a little Bruce or Batman scene at the end that tied things up with Veronica while also admitting he should have given Oswald more of the benefit of the doubt, but the way the story is works just fine. I'd recommend it as one of, if not, the best Penguin-centric episodes in Batman the Animated Series. Maybe the rumors of your reform are not exaggerated. Anything's possible when love is involved. In my world, you play by my rules. What is Reality is the second appearance of the Riddler in Batman the Animated Series. While in his first appearance, If You're So Smart, Why Aren't You Rich, Edward Nigma trapped our characters in a giant maze game, this time things shift to more of a digital frontier, as Batman and Robin try to outsmart Nigma in a virtual world of his own creation. Computer systems all over Gotham are going haywire, with riddles appearing on screens across the city. All traces of Edward Nigma have been deleted, while several of his goons steal the only paper copies on file. The Riddler then leaves a massive box at police headquarters that contains a huge computer, and the dynamic duo team up with Commissioner Gordon to solve Nigma's latest scheme. Robin and Gordon try their hand at figuring out the purpose of the computer, which contains a virtual world inside, as Batman tracks down leads elsewhere that he hopes will reveal the Riddler's location. But when Gordon becomes trapped inside Riddler's virtual reality, Batman is called back to police HQ to enter Nigma's latest creation himself and find the missing mind of the Commissioner. A new set of writers, Marty Eisenberg and Robert N. Skur, and director Dick Sebast, tackled the Riddler this time around. There are obvious similarities to the character's first go-around on the show, but this time out, things got even more surreal and the ending is quite different. Nigma's motivations against Batman and the police carry over directly from If You're So Smart, Why Aren't You Rich, and he's shown to be even further ahead of the good guys for most of the story. As I mentioned in our review of his first appearance, the crew had a tough time coming up with stories for the Riddler, and this would be the last episode featuring him as the main antagonist until Season 3's Riddler's Reform. Involving Robin again also worked out pretty well since Bruce had to rely on him in certain puzzling situations. The teenaged boy Wonder was previously established as a bit of a whiz with modern technology, and his role in this story was served well. His lighter attitude also factored in nicely. One particular moment with Commissioner Gordon still gets a small chuckle out of me. Your message sounded urgent. Found something? You bet you're... I mean, yes, sir. Gordon has other character-building episodes later. He's really just the damsel in distress here. As for Batman, he's not written as the smartest he's ever been, but he still has a few clever moments. I think a lot of that had to do with giving Robin some shine, since Wayne is out of his element in the virtual world. His solution for outsmarting the Riddler is less nuanced than you'd usually see, but it was effective nonetheless. In his second outing as Nigma, John Glover once again delivers a strong vocal performance. Riddler is shown to be a very formidable mental match for the Caped Crusader, and he's in total control for almost all 22 minutes. Seeing him several steps ahead of everyone else is a great example of how to use him correctly. The added benefit of his omnipotent presence in the virtual world gave him godlike abilities as he manipulated the space Batman occupied. He feels larger than life, and one of the only villains to keep you guessing on if he'll escape justice. We pretty much know the day will be saved, but I personally like the idea of the Riddler always being out there, planning his next big move. 
when Batman actually catches him, it should be a really big deal. The computer landscape is possibly the best thing about this episode. The Virtual Boy look actually came across alright, as it helped establish the visual difference between the real world and the artificial one. I do think green may have been a better fit instead of red though. It's on brand for Riddler, and I think a lot of people correlate green with a digital environment. That may just be the Matrix influencing my opinion though. The constantly morphing world made for some very bizarre moments, but in a good way. Like when the Riddler turns into a creepy smiling moon. Move according to the rules, or it's the end of the day. In that same chessboard scene, Batman has to move like a knight since one of his nicknames reflects that piece. He's even transformed into a more literal version of the Dark Knight in what's actually a pretty darn magnificent set of armor. This is one of those moments that I never forgot from the series upon originally seeing it. I recall thinking that was a really cool sequence when I was a kid. Spoilers from here on out. This episode doesn't hinge on the ending, but I do have a few things to say about it. Batman eventually finds the cube Riddler is keeping Gordon in, and without Robin to help, he improvises. Bruce starts making copies of himself to smash his way into the box, but Nigma matches him with duplicates of his own. This causes Riddler to lose concentration, and the world around them starts crumbling. Batman frees Gordon and escapes the virtual world, but Riddler isn't able to do the same before the whole computer shorts out. They eventually find him at the World's Fair with his mind scrambled, apparently lost, in his own program. I like just about everything in this episode, aside from the ending there. It's not a bad finish to the story, but as I said before, I think Riddler is just more dangerous as a character if he's the one guy we never see Batman catch. They build him up so wonderfully across his first two episodes, so I think this would have been believable, especially considering he so sparsely shows up. Anyway, this episode is a definite recommendation from me. Check it out for a great mix of retro and futuristic imagery, a strong villain, and a few memorable moments. The name is Riddler. Edward Nickma no longer exists. I absolutely love I Am The Night. It is positively one of my top 10 favorite episodes. These character versus self stories always capture my attention, and that type of conflict is at the core of this installment of the show. Batman doubting himself and his mission isn't something we see too often, so when it's done this well with such great voice acting and powerful scenes, it needs to be recognized as the exceptional piece of work that it is. Batman is worn down. The ongoing battle against crime in Gotham has eroded his once determined spirit. On the anniversary of his parents' murder, he visits Crime Alley with Leslie Tompkins to pay his respects, but in doing so, he runs into a bit of trouble with a local youth and ends up late to the police's planned sting of Jimmy Jazzman Peak. The sting goes wrong, but with Batman arriving to help, they capture the Jazzman. During the firefight, however, Commissioner Gordon is shot and rushed to the hospital. He's put in intensive care, as his condition is touch and go. Batman blames himself for Gordon's state and seriously wonders if he's putting more people at risk than he's saving. Meanwhile, Jazzman breaks out of prison and makes his way to the hospital. He plans to finish the job he started with Gordon, who he's had a vendetta against since the commissioner busted him six years earlier. It shouldn't be a shock that I love this episode, since Michael Reeves wrote it. He was one of the two people who came up with the story for my favorite episode of the series, Perchance to Dream. His story credits also include Feet of Clay, Second Chance, and many more. I don't think I've talked too much about the late Boyd Kirkland, but he directed over 20 episodes of the series, including Perchance to Dream, and some of my other favorites, like It's Never Too Late, Beware the Grey Ghost, and His Silicon Soul. There's one decently big action sequence here when the police and Jazzman's gang clash, but this story is most compelling in the quiet scenes that capture the heart of Batman. Who he is, what he wants, and if continuing on under the cape and cowl is even worth it. That kind of stuff is fascinating to me with a character like Bruce Wayne. Every year I come here, I wonder if it should be the last time, if I should put the past behind me. After Gordon is shot, Bruce is sent into an even further downward spiral. Already placing the commissioner's injury on his own shoulders, he's made to feel worse by the belligerent Harvey Bullock. 
This ain't over yet, outlaw! You're going down for this! I ain't talking law! I'm talking you and me! A lot of passion there from Bullock, even more than usual. Despite his gruff appearance, he genuinely cares about Jim Gordon, and seeing him go down the way he did had the detective looking for someone to blame. Since he never really liked Batman in the first place, the man in the mask was an easy target. As Gordon lay unconscious, Alfred sends Dick Grayson to the Batcave in hopes of getting through to an isolated Wayne. This is some of the best existential material in the whole series. Unfortunately, I can't play you the whole scene, but go back and watch it. The entire sequence is so good. I love it. Sooner or later, I'll go down. It might be the Joker, or Two-Face, or just some punk who gets lucky. My decision, no regrets. But I can't let anyone else pay for my mistakes. How long before I let someone else I care about down? Leslie, Alfred, you. Since Batman is a publicly known entity in this world, Bruce even calls out how he thinks the Dark Knight has become a bit of a joke. They sell t-shirts of me. I've become a cliché, more good for the tourist trade than the streets. Maybe it's time for Batman to return to the night that spawned him, before anyone else gets hurt. A little later, Grayson has a poignant character moment of his own. It's simple, but very effective in this story. You taught me everything I know about crime fighting, Bruce, but the most important lesson was to never give up. Dick Grayson is such a great character. I love seeing him be the one to try and pull Bruce out of this crisis. It's also bittersweet to look back, considering what happens with them later on. Spoilers from here on out, but I think you know where this is going. Spurred on by Robin's words, Bruce steps back into the Batsuit and rides off to find Jazzman before he can get to Gordon. He arrives just in time, but Peek is still able to smash his way into the Commissioner's room. The climax of the sequence happens in some intense slow motion. Yeah! Bullock arrests Jazzman immediately after, and we get a touching scene from the awakened Gordon. Gotta keep fighting, never stop. Maybe if I'd been younger. Could have been like you. Always wanted to be a hero. You are a hero, Jim. Afterward, Batman runs into the kid from earlier in Crime Alley. He was involved with the wrong people and had a very sarcastic attitude then, but after dropping him off at the Mitchell Street mission, it seems something finally connected with him. I'm heading back home. And I guess I kind of owe it to you, Batman. You probably saved my life. Seeing that he does have a positive effect on the world around him, even if it's the smallest impact, Batman looks over Gotham with a renewed sense of purpose as we fade to black. While the animation by Sunrise ranges from good to great, and the score, specifically the theme by Michael McCustion, hits it out of the park, the real stars of this episode are the voice actors. This is one of the best pure performance-driven stories on the show. Michael Reeves' writing gave everyone a chance to shine, and they all shined brightly. From the guest stars such as the Jason Todd-like character voiced by Seth Green and Brian George's menacing jazz man, to the regulars like Lauren Lester, Robert Costanzo, and Melissa Gilbert, each of them elevate their scenes and the episode to another level. You can tell Kevin Conroy in particular was really into the lines he was given. If you ever want to hear and see the inner struggles of a weary Batman, this is something you'll get a lot of dramatic fulfillment from. Sure, there might be a moment or two where it goes slightly over the top, but that's very easy to look past when the content and subtext are this good. See for yourself and pull I Am The Night out of the darkness. Off Balance is a significant episode for a few reasons. Talia al Ghul is first introduced here in a story based on a comic from the 70s. It acts as a prelude for what's to come, as one of Batman's most dangerous enemies is shown waiting in the wings. The Society of Shadows has infiltrated Gotham in order to steal a new high-tech weapon being shipped to Wayne Enterprises. Batman is on the case as he battles their leader, Vertigo, but Bruce also finds an unlikely ally in the mysterious Talia. She seems to know much about their operation, and claims her father is trying to stop Vertigo as well. 
Together, they attempt to halt the plans of the eye-patched criminal and his underlings before the Society of Shadows escapes with the dangerous ultrasonic drill. Len Wein returned to write this episode, modeled after Detective Comics number 411 from 1971, titled Into the Den of the Death Dealers. The story was written by Dennis O'Neill and told the tale of Batman and Talia's first meeting. This installment of the animated series followed the book pretty closely, with a few characters and situations changed. Gotham's stand-in for the Statue of Liberty is featured prominently in the opening, and that whole scene is great. Batman's informant is even tossed off the top of it. I think they tried to imply he survived, but come on. Come on. The hook that sequence gave us for the rest of the story is delivered effectively as we're introduced to the Society of Shadows. Otherwise known as the League of Shadows or the League of Assassins, this organization is pretty well known among Batman fans for their appearances in the books and animated slash live action movies that would follow this episode. The villain Vertigo is the main antagonist in Off Balance and the apparent leader of the Society of Shadows. In the comics, there's a Green Arrow villain called Count Vertigo that later appeared in other DC TV properties, but he's portrayed a bit differently here. His eye patch gives off some kind of radiation that distorts his victim's visual perception. This gave the animation team at Sunrise the opportunity to create some exaggerated surreal imagery. Those scenes were unique and without a doubt the most signature aspect of this installment. It's another one of those elements that have stuck with me since first seeing it in the 90s, so even though this is Vertigo's only appearance, it is a memorable one for me. Spoilers from here on out. There is a twist I'll mention in a minute, but it's an obvious one. Vertigo ends up falling out of the bell tower in the monastery he was hiding out in with his henchmen. This sequence seems to be an homage to the famous Alfred Hitchcock movie, Vertigo, where a similar thing happened. Knowing this may also explain the emphasis on the villain's eyepiece that induces a form of Vertigo. This story is where I was first introduced to the character of Talia. Aside from Catwoman, she's probably Bruce's most consistent love interest across his entire 80 plus year run. There have been others, but in more recent years, the addition of Damian Wayne, the son of Bruce and Talia, has made her influence even more prominent. She ends up having a lot of history with Bruce throughout the DCAU. This is previewed by Talia unmasking Bruce and discovering his identity in her first appearance. Guess he wasn't thinking about identity protection as much as some of his future counterparts. It's interesting because in the production order, they chose to give us an entire episode with Talia before focusing fully on her father, Ra's al Ghul. It's a nice little preview for what's to come, and the ending revelation that she was a part of the Society of Shadows from the beginning led to a small cameo with Ra's at the end. He only has a couple lines, but makes it clear that his business with Batman is far from finished. Talia did end up getting away with the ultrasonic drill, but Bruce sabotaged it before handing it over. This mistrust between Batman and the Al Ghuls often overshadows the respect among them and romantic feelings between Wayne and Talia. As for Raish himself, he'd soon have his day that we'll talk about later this month. This episode is memorable for me and notable in the mythology of the show, but it's nothing fantastic. There are a few good scenes, but the promise of Raish showing up down the road is what its main purpose seemed to be. In terms of a recommendation, I'm on the fence. We do get some classic Alfred sassiness. Alfred, you're brilliant. Yeah, so I've heard. And there's for sure more to like, but it does drag a little bit in the second half, and it just doesn't feel like an elite episode. You could probably jump into the demon's quest and not miss a beat, but if you're a big Talia or Ra's al Ghul fan, you'll likely have a good enough time with Off Balance. As you said, detective, this is not over. I love The Man Who Killed Batman. I think I've even grown to love it more over the years. It's a great concept, introduces a new character interacting with a handful of favorites, and it's one of the best Joker episodes of the whole show. It is legitimately funny and clever too. Visuals, dialogue, music, etc, it's just a classic. And one of the most impressive things about it is that it achieves all these things without Batman being present for most of the runtime. Running a drug operation for Rupert Thorne, a small group of his thugs take along the small-statured Sidney Debris to unknowingly take the fall. 
During the run, Batman arrives and confronts Sid on a roof. Terrified, Sid nearly falls off before Batman saves him, but in the struggle, Bruce is accidentally pulled over the edge and seemingly lands on an exploding propane tank. Thinking him dead, all of Gotham's underworld hails Sid the Squid as the man who killed the Dark Knight. Word gets around until Joker hears the news and decides to meet Sid himself, hoping to find out if Batman really has been offed and just who this guy really is. Bruce Timm directed this episode himself with Paul Dini penning the script. Basically, any time those two were directly involved in the same episode, it made for something special. The idea supposedly came about when the pair were discussing if an episode could work without Batman in most of it. The answer was obviously yes. This isn't the first or last time Batman had minimal involvement in an installment of the show, but I will say this is a more direct example of that idea since the whole story revolves around Batman being taken out early. Sid the Squid wasn't an established character, although he does share a few defining characteristics with some of the more meek side players in the series, like G. Carl Francis from another Deanie Tim collaboration, The Laughing Fish. It's a bit of a risk to put a whole narrative on the back of an unknown character and follow his little interactions with the personalities we do know, but that's also why it works. The thought of Batman finally meeting his demise at the incompetent hands of someone who wasn't even trying to kill him gives us an absurd but also highly intriguing place to start from. I love how Sid is treated like a hero for killing the bane of Gotham's criminal's existence. How he finally gets recognition for something in his life sort of makes you happy for him. If this was a bigger, more serious angle where Batman really was at least gone for a long while, the feelings would be different, but since we know this is just a single episode in the show, it's not a question if Batman comes back, it's how and when. Thus, we don't feel as bad seeing Sid lauded by those he always sought validation from. If he was a slimier character and less of an underdog, it wouldn't have landed as well. He's such an almost innocent bystander in the crowd he runs around with, you just find yourself rooting for him a bit. When the Joker is brought into the story, we start to see the true ramifications of what the death of Batman might be like. Firstly, Harley gets Sid out of prison by posing as his lawyer. She even uses her actual name, which you'd think the police, especially Bullock, would notice, but at this point in the show, the Harleen Quinzel name might not have been solidified as her actual identity. I'm sure there are a few ways you can legitimize her getting away with this, but it is something small that clashes with later continuity. Regardless, Harley gives us one particularly hilarious moment that cracks me up. Don't I know you from someplace? I think I served you a subpoena once. It was a small subpoena. Great timing on that delivery. Arlene Sorkin always seemed to excel in those little moments. Harley playing Amazing Grace on the kazoo at Batman's mock funeral is also morbidly humorous. The Joker eulogizing Batman with Sid in attendance is just as funny, while also striking at the center of the character. I love that Joker doesn't really want Batman dead. He has in other episodes, but I think the character is strongest when he freely admits that screwing with Batman in a variety of insignificant and egregious ways is his motivating function for being the Joker. He's outwardly upset that Batman is dead here. The man who killed Batman. There's a certain rhythm to these things. I cause trouble, he shows up. We have some laughs and the game starts all over again. He's definitely jealous and feels shown up by some nobody like Sid doing what he couldn't or wouldn't. But there is a defining line he says which summarizes his relationship with Batman from the clown's perspective. Without Batman, crime has no punchline. Again, the following scene at the funeral is all top notch. The kick me sign is just the icing on the cake. Wanting to kill Sid for killing Batman, all at Ace Chemicals by the way, is the exact right kind of twisted. Joker's reaction after he thinks Sid is dead is a beautiful microcosm of his erratic personality. <sighs> well, that was fun. Who's for Chinese? Sid's whole story is being recounted to Rupert Thorne, since the squid is looking for a way out of town, with the crime boss being the guy to make that happen. Eventually, Thorne thinks he's being played and doesn't believe the man who killed Batman could be such a bumbling dweeb. No one's that lucky or stupid. Spoilers, but Batman's alive. He reappears here to save Sid from Thorne, saying he swung away from the explosion earlier and has been tailing debris the entire time. 
The squid is still going to jail, but because of his reputation of almost killing Batman, embarrassing the Joker, and facing down Thorn, he's finally treated as the big shot he always wanted to be by his fellow inmates. So a happy ending for Sid. I don't think you'll see many people complain about that. The technical aspects of this episode deserve substantial praise. The opening with Sid running in the rain produces gorgeous, striking images. I love when debris steps on the newspaper informing us of Batman's yet unknown fate. The heavy shadows and noir look give this episode some extra visual power that set the tone perfectly. Speaking of tone, Shirley Walker's score provides us with a mix of organ and horns that improve every scene. They play it up like a warped funeral soundtrack, while also emphasizing the danger Sid finds himself in after Batman's death. It reminded me a lot of a Danny Elfman score, which was obviously an inspiration for a lot of the music in this series. Even the opening theme is technically Elfman, but this episode really felt like it was utilizing the gothic nature of the Burton films in its music. The Man Who Killed Batman is a must-see. It's required watching if you're looking for some of the best this show has to offer. Also, if you want some of the best Joker scenes, his screen time here is Hamill, Deany, and in my opinion the character himself at his strongest. It's funny, it's different, it's kind of thought-provoking, it looks and sounds great, and it has top talent behind it. Give this one a watch or rewatch, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Its greatness speaks for itself. I'll be smiling again, just as soon as we take that man there, and slap him in that box there, and roll it into that vat of acid there. Mudslide is a sequel to the two-parter Feet of Clay from earlier in the first season. It continues the story of Matt Hagen and his violent quest to become himself again. It's not as fondly remembered or highly regarded as his first appearance, but the story is just as tragic with more well-done animation. We see the continued downward spiral of Clayface and its high drama, as always. Clayface is back, but not in good shape. He encounters Batman on his latest robbery and is clearly losing his form. Barely escaping in the car of a Dr. Stella Bates, they return to her lab where she uses special chemicals and a bodysuit to keep him from falling apart. The solution to Hagen's problem may be available in a rare isotope called MP40. It could fully restore or even amplify his powers, but it's only available at Wayne Biomedical Labs. Meanwhile, Batman tries to find out Stella's identity and connection to Matt. When Clayface eventually breaches Wayne Biomedical, it leads to a confrontation that may just be curtains for the former actor. The original writers and directors of Feet of Clay Parts 1 and 2 did not return for Mudslide. Instead, series co-creator Eric Radomski handled directing duties with producer Alan Burnett coming up with the story and Steve Perry writing. The episode is on the same level of quality, even if it's not as well known. Hagen's descent here is a natural progression from the last time we saw him. It's been said that the main reason we only got two appearances from Clayface before the new Batman Adventures redesign was because he was too expensive to animate. That definitely checks out. TMS animated perhaps the best looking sequence in the show's history in Feet of Clay Part 2, and that did not look cheap. Studio Junio handled the animation in Mudslide, and while there's no sequence like the finale of the character's last appearance, they still did a really good job showcasing Clayface's more grotesque fading abilities. Hagen is still shown to be a sympathetic enough character for Batman to want to help. Clayface is a very stubborn, mutated man though. I'm guessing he just doesn't trust Batman, but he does look in a desperate enough place to where if he did take up the Dark Knight's offer, it might actually be believable. Instead, he's aided by an old medical consultant from one of his movies. Dr. Bates is shown to be in love with Hagen, which makes his manipulation of her easier. I don't think he has authentic romantic feelings for her, but I guess that is left to question. I'm sorry. I know I owe everything to you. You cured more than my body. You cured my heart. 
The irony in the isotope pagan needs being located at Wayne Biomedical is another tragic twist of fate. If Clayface agreed to let Batman help him, he may have been able to work with Dr. Bates and, as Bruce Wayne, provide enough of the MP40 to heal Hagen's melting form. Clayface does get away with a canister of the isotope and gets as far as Bates starting the injections. When Batman discovers the lab, though, he shuts down the procedure. I'm thinking his motivations for doing that involved the unpredictability of the MP40. It was shown to be working before Batman intervened, and Bates mentioned that it could make the Clayface ability strong enough to take on the form of Matt Hagen permanently. But making his ability stronger could also mean an unhinged Clayface, able to live his life as Matt Hagen and transform into anyone else whenever he wanted to get whatever he wanted. Batman mentions letting the lab boys take over, so maybe he'd keep this experiment going somehow, but there were probably too many variables to let things play out the way they were. Spoilers for the climax from here on out. In a really well done sequence, Batman is absorbed into Clayface as Hagen attempts to drown his enemy. Like a lot of other moments involving Clayface, this happens horrifically, and Batman's escape is just as jarring. Huh? The ending is another devastating one, as Hagen battles Batman outside in the rain. He starts to come apart before falling to his apparent demise in the water below. It's a great scene, and we wouldn't see Clayface show up again until Holiday Nights, though his survival isn't explained until another heart-wrenching story called Growing Pains. Both of those appearances happen in the new Batman Adventure season. There are more than a few film references in Mudslide. Hagen's love interest is named Stella Bates, and used to own a motel that she sold to build her secret lab. The Bates name and motel mention is a nice reference to Psycho. The Stella name and Hagen's brilliant shouting of it STELLA! STELLA! is a reference to Marlon Brando in A Streetcar Named Desire. The old Hagen movie Stella is watching is called Dark Interlude, which bears a passing resemblance to the 1939 film Dark Victory. Interlude was the movie Bates was the medical consultant on, and Clayface uses his line from the end of it to soothe her later. The Warner Brothers logo shown at the end adds a nice bit of legitimacy to that in-universe film. Hagen's bodysuit also resembles an Oscar, and a lot of his lines toward the end are film or theater industry terms. You've upstaged me for the last time, Batman. Time to bring down the curtain. Shirley Walker's musical score is a strong element of the final product, as usual. That Clayface theme is one of the show's best pieces of music, and it's used to full effect in Hagen's epic fall from the cliff. Best moment of the episode right there. Mudslide is a worthy sequel to Feet of Clay and ended the tragedy of Clayface for a few years. I think the only thing missing was an appearance from Hagen's old friend Teddy. His presence was missed. I could have seen him having a small role in helping Batman to identify Dr. Bates and track down Matt, but oh well. Watch this back to back with the Feet of Clay two-parter if you're in the mood for a somber, visceral, and monstrous Batman villain story. Paging the Crime Doctor shades in a few layers to the past of Thomas Wayne. This isn't the most action-packed episode of the series, but it does a good job of focusing on a few background characters with a connection to Bruce's family. It stands out to me because of one great little moment that is among the best in the show. Former doctor Matthew Thorne has been working for his brother, crime boss Rupert Thorne, to discreetly treat his henchmen for years. Long ago, his medical license was revoked when he didn't report one of Rupert's injuries to the police. Still bitter at his brother, he's put in a difficult situation when Rupert is revealed to have a tumor growing near his heart. Refusing to go to the hospital, the crime lord begs his brother to operate. Needing assistance, Matthew's old classmate, Dr. Leslie Tompkins, is abducted and forced to help with the surgery. When Bruce discovers his family friend's office ransacked, he finds a clue that points him in the direction of the Thorns being involved. This episode has a lot of credited writers behind it. Well, at least more than usual. Mike W. Barr and Laren Bright came up with the story, while Randy Rogel and the late Martin Pascoe wrote the teleplay. 
The illegal surgery and unwilling participant angle used here is something we'd see again in the movie Batman and Mr. Freeze, Sub-Zero. That film was co-written by Randy Rogel, so we may have seen an idea that worked here repeated in that script with a slightly different wrinkle. Frank Parr handled directing duties for this understated story that follows a more obscure villain from the comics. Although, the crime doctor is recontextualized here as a sympathetic family member caught up in his brother's life of transgressions. It reminds me a bit of It's Never Too Late, with a crime boss having a more upstanding brother. But in this case, it's taken a little further since Matt is directly involved in Rupert's organization. I do really enjoy the exploration of Matthew's connection to Leslie Tompkins and Thomas Wayne. Just the little hints dropped throughout the episode are a nice touch. Any idea who Matt is? Yes, I believe your father mentioned him. One of their colleagues in medical school. Very close friends they all were. Called themselves the Three Musketeers, in fact. The shadow of Bruce's father looms large here. Even though we don't get a flashback or anything like that, the mentions of him by the people who were his friends had me wanting to know more. And watching Bruce sort of break down to Matt at the end of the episode is a fantastic moment. Something you know. Something only you can give me. Tell me about my father. It's one of the only times we see something like this where Bruce isn't brooding or talking with Alfred about his parents. He went out of his way as Bruce Wayne to talk with Matt about his dad. The vulnerability he shows to a stranger makes that line even more impactful. And it's a base emotion that we can all relate to. It doesn't have to be a parent, but any family member who means something to us. Maybe we only knew them when they were older, or we didn't get a chance to know them at all. But encountering someone who knew them from a specific time period and carries all those experiences with them can be like finding a little piece of hidden treasure. What was this person like before I was around? It's a great question, and it's the main reason why I like this episode so much. Whenever Leslie Tompkins shows up, you can usually count on the episode being high quality. We get to see her work a little bit at the free clinic that bears Thomas Wayne's name, and just watching her interact with Bruce is a treat. Alfred fills the role of a father figure at times, and this episode talks a lot about Bruce's dad, but as I've mentioned in her other appearances, Leslie providing a motherly figure for Wayne to talk to always felt like a fresh dynamic. Your father, God rest him. He called you stubborn from the day you were born. Always used to say you had a very hard head. He didn't know the half of it. There are a few odd aspects to this story, like the gun-shaped medical laser that Rupert Thorne's men steal. It's used to seriously injure Batman at one point, and the limp ear is kind of a funny visual. Also, a random nurse henchman of Thorne's nearly kills Batman by getting the jump on him. I know they were playing up his injury, but it always bothers me when a low-level thug nearly takes out Batman without a good reason. It's okay, though, because it sounded like he snapped this guy's neck. <laughs> Shirley Walker was so good at her job that her name is synonymous with quality. I could just say, Shirley Walker did the music, and you know by now how much I loved it. They play a pleasant horn version of the Batman theme when talking about Thomas, and it's perfect for the purposes utilized. In fact, I think they used something like this when we see Bruce's parents in Perchance to Dream. So a bit of a recurring theme for Thomas Wayne there. At one point, this episode was in my top 10, but on this last rewatch, it's not quite as good as I remember it from a few years back. Still a strong recommendation for me, especially for all the Thomas Wayne talk, but it's not as high up on my list as it once was. Paging the Crime Doctor has a great premise and works best as a smaller emotional story. The character content drives it forward. It's just too bad we never got to see Matt Thorne show up again. Like Leslie, he could have been a nice presence to bring out once in a while. Check it out for a little background on Bruce's dad and the company he kept. Zatanna introduces another DC character with a connection to Batman. Here, they give her a history with Bruce when they were younger, which makes for a nice flashback. 
This one ends up being an old-fashioned caper with some sleight of hand thrown in. Its climax in the villain's giant plane is definitely worth discussing. Zatanna is a famous magician who is putting on a big show at the Gotham Mint. Her biggest trick of the night sees the entire building disappear in a giant puff of smoke with $10 million on display inside. When she makes the mint reappear, the money is missing, and she's immediately arrested. Bruce Wayne and Alfred are shown in the audience, as we see that Bruce once knew her while training in the art of escapism with Zatanna's renowned father, Zatara. He knows she's innocent, and as Batman, breaks Zatanna out of police custody, and the pair begin searching for the person who framed her. Paul Dini penned the script, as he did for Zatanna's other significant appearance in the DCAU, that being down the road in Justice League Unlimited. Interestingly, there are two directors credited for this episode. Dick Sebast was originally working on it before apparently departing the show. Dan Reba then took over. In the production order, this was only the second episode he took that position on, the first being the fantastic mini-movie See No Evil, which we reviewed last year. Whenever we see Bruce training to become Batman, it feels special. That's the case in the three-minute flashback sequence where Wayne is training with Zatara. They changed his design again to look younger with Kevin Conroy using that lighter voice we heard in Night of the Ninja. Speaking of which, this is even earlier in his journey than when he was training under Yoru Sensei. Bruce mentions that he's leaving for Japan the following day, tying these two episodes together. His relationship with Zatanna is shown to be yet another lost love Wayne could have been happy with, but it occurring when he was still a young man makes it unique from the others. There's an obvious connection between the two. However, in maybe my favorite moment of the episode, it's clear that the pair aren't exactly destined to be together. Here, pick a card. I'll tell your future. Hmm, I see emotion, intensity, two of hearts. Joker. Great stuff. It's also worth noting that, unlike his time in Japan, he never gave Zatara or his daughter his real name. Instead, he goes by John Smith. Even later on, when Batman drops a hint that he's the same man who learned from her father, Zatanna doesn't know him as Bruce Wayne, and still refers to him as John in her message. With all that backstory, Zatanna herself is a decently well-rounded character for one appearance. She has a background cameo in chemistry, but doesn't show up in the DCAU again until Justice League Unlimited made it to the airwaves. One thing missing from her design is her trademark fishnet tights. She doesn't even really have them later on in her JLU appearances. This was supposedly due to them being too difficult to animate. As for her actual magical powers, those do show up in JLU. Here, she's portrayed as just an illusionist. Zatara is voiced in the flashbacks by the late Vincent Chiavelli, which is pretty cool since he also made an appearance in Batman Returns. The character is said to be dead by the time this episode happens. We hear this in a few lines from Zatanna as Batman questions what her current status is after years of no communication. He sinuously even asks if she's married, which shows that Bruce is probably still attracted to her. Earlier, Wayne tries telling Alfred that he was a different person back when he knew her, but the butler's response is priceless. Yes, intense, driven, moody. She'd never recognize you now. This is technically a spoiler, but it's incredibly evident who the antagonist of the story is right from the beginning. Dr. Montague Kane is a magic debunker, and sets up a very Indiana Jones-style trap for Batman and Zatanna when they track him down to his house. His design sort of reminds me of Orson Welles, and the last name Kane may suggest that was the intention, but he's got a villainous tinge to his look here. Michael York's voice gives him a very distinct personality, and he even calls Batman by a familiar name. Keep your distance, detective! Some of York's inflections and overall accent allude a little bit to David Warner's Ra's al Ghul. York also voiced Vertigo in Off Balance, which was the debut of Ra's, so there's more than one connection. Whether this was meant to draw comparisons or not, I don't really know, but you can certainly make the case that those choices had a purpose. Kane stole the $10 million and skipped town in an enormous state-of-the-art aircraft. The climax there is a strong one. It's filled with high-rising action, escapist tricks, Batman manually controlling the altitude of the plane, some tape visible in a few of the frames, and Zatanna delivering an appropriate one-liner. 
Don't you know? A magician never does the same trick twice! Oh. Zatan is a pretty good episode. It's always good to see some background on Bruce's time traveling the world, and having a friend instead of an enemy come back into his life made for a fun little adventure. See for yourself if this episode has enough of the magic you're looking for. The mechanic is all about the Batmobile, and it presents a really intriguing idea. Someone outside the Bat family is responsible for the design, creation, and maintenance of the famous vehicle. Penguin is also the villain in this story, and a plotline lifted straight from Batman Returns. In fact, that may not be the only part of this episode inspired by that film. I'll explain soon. After the Batmobile is heavily damaged while in pursuit of Penguin's gang, the dynamic duo bring it to a secure location to get it fixed by a mechanic and his daughter. Earl and Marva Cooper don't know who Batman is, but he pays Earl handsomely for the work while giving them ample space and equipment to work with. Through trying to fix their own car, one of Penguin's henchmen brings in his old friend from an auto parts distributor. Arnold Rundell has information he thinks Cobblepot will be interested in. He's noticed that very unusual parts have recently been ordered for what he thinks has to be the one and only Batmobile. Rundle hands over Earl's information, and soon enough, Penguin and his gang crash Cooper's secret repair spot. They kidnap Marva and force Earl to sabotage the Batmobile to give Penguin control over it. Cooper follows through and returns the vehicle to Batman and Robin. Soon after, they're chasing Penguin again. But this time, Oswald is one step ahead of them. Directing regular Kevin Altieri helmed this episode, with Randy Rogel writing from a story by Laren Bright and Steve Perry. Let's just get the obvious out of the way first. The concept of Penguin rigging and controlling the Batmobile was featured pretty prominently in Batman Returns. I'm not sure why it was repeated here, because it's not that revolutionary of an idea. They even have Penguin's hideout in the sewer with that big yellow duck being used again. However, the story surrounding all this is pretty cool, and definitely unique in a few ways. Introducing a new character who helped Batman become what he is adds another layer to his inner circle. The curtain is sort of peeled back here to show us the Dark Knight doesn't do this alone. Of course, we have Robin and later Batgirl helping him directly, and Alfred performs a whole variety of tasks that keeps Batman going, but seeing an outside person heavily involved in a major part of Batman's arsenal makes everything feel just a touch more realistic. It reminds me a little bit of Lucius Fox's role in the Dark Knight trilogy. He provides Christian Bale's Batman with all his tech from the Applied Sciences division of Wayne Enterprises. In Batman Begins, Alfred also mentions that he orders all of Batman's suit parts in large bulk from dummy corporations to distract suspicion. We ordered a main part of this car from Singapore. Via dummy corporation. And then quite separately, we place an order to a Chinese company for these. They'll have to be uh, large orders uh, to avoid suspicion, say uh, 10,000. Wayne's failure to do that in this episode leads to Cooper being found by Penguin. By the end, though, Batman changes his strategy. I had my backers set up dummy corporations to order the parts through, so no one can ever trace you again. I really like the flashback that shows how Earl got involved with Batman in the first place. He used to work for a company called Global Motors, who refused to listen to his warnings about the safety of their new car. The CEO hires goons to keep him quiet, which is where Batman, in the older suit we've seen him don in other flashbacks, arrived to stop them. Afterwards, Earl was out of a job and in desperate need of work when Batman approached him in the first Batmobile. That one looks similar to some of the original designs from the comics. He asks Cooper to build him a new car, and with unlimited resources, Earl designs and builds the modern Batmobile. This explanation is a bit contradictory to a nod to the origin of the vehicle in Mask of the Phantasm. A young Bruce is at the Gotham World's Fair with Andrea Beaumont, where he sees a car that looks almost exactly like his future Batmobile. Maybe he collaborated with Earl on the design, but either way, I do love how this one looks. It's right up there with the Burton version as the best looking Batmobile. In my opinion, that is. Eventually, Batman and Robin are able to escape the booby-trapped car before it's destroyed. They then apprehend Penguin and his henchmen. Later, Earl pledges to make a new Batmobile, 
one even better with more advanced technology. Penguin is then shown back in jail as the episode wraps up. One thing I wanted to bring up about Earl and the concept of someone else fixing the Batmobile is that something pretty close to that was almost the origin of Robin in Batman Returns. It's pretty well known now that Marlon Wayans was cast as Robin and set to appear in a small scene, although his only function in that film was supposedly fixing the Batmobile for Bruce while wearing a jumpsuit that had a small R on the chest. He ended up being cut from the movie before they even started shooting, but he was supposed to appear in what turned into Batman Forever before Tim Burton left the project. In the upcoming comic series Batman 89, the original writer from that first film, Sam Hamm, and artist Joe Quinanez are possibly going to explore that version of Robin and how he would have tied into that universe. There's even a concept image out there of Quinanez's artwork that was a part of a pitch he made for the series several years ago. Does that mechanic thing sound familiar? I wonder if Steve Perry, Laren Bright, and or Randy Rogel were privy to any of that information when writing this episode. They certainly could have had access to it. Did they use that idea after it was discarded from Returns, or was it just a coincidence? I'm genuinely curious. Anyway, Penguin has a few kind of funny, kind of awkward moments in this. The first involves his car pulling in front of the Batmobile. Did that car... F fart? <laughs> what? Why? After he's back in prison, Cobblepot is cleaning license plates when he delivers this winner. Ah, one bat for you. I just love how Paul Williams says that. It's hilarious. The mechanic is not a traditionally amazing installment of the show, but it is different and interesting enough to recommend. With the late Paul Winfield voicing Earl, that flashback, and the curious history of this concept, it's worth seeing. Check it out. I think you'll enjoy this change of pace. B -b 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 that's all, folks. <laughs> Harley and Ivy not only broke the mold from what Batman the Animated Series was known for, but it also established the relationship between the titular characters. A relationship that has always been popular among fans, and is still being explored in the Harley Quinn show. It's a very different kind of episode that works as a comedy, misadventure, villainous team-up, and more. But make no mistake, the dynamic created here among the main characters makes this installment an important one. After being kicked out of Joker's gang, Harley Quinn tries to go it alone and make a name for herself. When she tries to steal a rare diamond from the Gotham Museum of Natural History, she runs into Poison Ivy, who's there stealing plant toxins. They're able to escape the police and join forces for a crime spree that gets the attention of both Joker and Batman. Still longing for her Mr. J, Harley goes back and forth on returning to her old life, while Ivy tries to convince her to forget about the clown and continue their successful run of criminal activity. This all leads to a showdown with Batman and Joker at the toxic waste dump that Harley and Ivy have made their hideout. Paul Dini was behind the writing of this episode, and that's no surprise. He continued to pair these two up into the new Batman adventures, and even wrote an episode of Static Shock that featured them together. The web series Gotham Girls had Dini writing more stories for this duo as well. Plus, we can't forget about the comic book series he collaborated on with Bruce Timm and others. Boyd Kirkland was tasked with directing Harley and Ivy, something he mentioned he was excited about in the commentary. I was thrilled to get this script, Paul. I think you wrote a really fun story and it was a delight. I, I had a great time putting this one together. It's also one of the favorite episodes of Arlene Sorkin, the voice of Harley. So it's ranked high, not only among fans of the show, but on the list of the creative team behind it as well. It's easy to see why. There's a certain charm to Harley and Ivy unique to this story. There are other Harley-centric episodes later on, with at least one eclipsing this in my opinion, but the chemistry between Harleen Quinzel and Pamela Isley propels this installment to a class all its own. The episode debuted on January 18, 1993. The popular film Thelma and Louise hit theaters in 1991, which had a sort of similar idea with two women on the run from authorities. One could easily say Harley and Ivy was influenced by that movie, but in the commentary, Paul Dini says that wasn't exactly the case. 
Did you also say something to the effect of uh, Thelma and Louise with supervillains? I had actually not seen Thelma and Louise when I wrote it, and then I think it was in animation. I sat down and watched the movie, and it's like, oh, they're running around blowing up stuff too. Well, uh, that, that's kind of <laughs> a logical thing to do for two crazed women on the loose. I uh, just sort of, uh, I guess, channeled the movie before even seeing it. If you've ever watched that Harley Quinn animated show on the old DC Universe app or HBO Max, this is definitely the clear blueprint. Harley gets kicked out by Joker, but still pines for him, and they're to put it lightly, dysfunctional relationship is delved into a bit. Joker's feeling of ownership over Quinn is shown while she's trying to establish herself as a villain in her own right. Add Poison Ivy into the mix and the formula is basically the same. Granted, they've gotten to do a lot more with this kind of thing in the Harley Quinn show and the tone is very different there. It gets to be more absurd with its comedy and directly call out tropes within the entirety of the DC Universe, but back in Harley and Ivy, it still felt like it was given the freedom to at least be more goofy than a regular episode. One of my favorite moments is when Ivy attacks Joker after he tried to poison her with his flower. Get him. Hilarious. Speaking of Joker, he's great in this episode. While not exactly the focus, Mark Hamill got to play up a lot of jealousy in his performance, which came through strong. The visuals look pretty great throughout too, and that may be due to TMS providing the layouts for this Dong Yang animated episode. Joker himself looks good, except for this one scene where he looks like Jay Leno with a slightly smaller chin. Certain sequences definitely look better than others, but I do think the animation deserves mention here. Batman shows up sparingly, and that was the right choice to make Harley and Ivy stand out even more. We do get to see a new Batman-themed gas mask, though, and that looked awesome. <gasps> Evening, ladies. Playtime's over. He was wearing it because of the fumes at the waste dump, but it's taken off as he's thrown into toxic water. He doesn't put it back on after this, and no one else is wearing one, so it ended up being a little pointless, but again, it looked awesome. They do explain away Harley being immune to the area because of a vaccine Ivy gives to her. I'd say Batman acts as a bit of an antagonist in this episode, and spoilers, he's not the one who apprehends Quinn and Isley in the end. All right, ladies, raise them. Renee Montoya got outfoxed by the pair a few times, so it was nice to see her get the win there. Qué mala suerte. I really enjoyed the more upbeat music. Shirley Walker is the only credited composer, but according to volume two of the show's soundtrack, Lolita Ritmanis, Michael McCustian, and Peter Davidson also had a hand in shaping the score. I love how it's used in the old-timey newspaper montage, showing Harley and Ivy's rise to prominence together. A few miscellaneous notes include Rosebud as the license plate of Ivy's pink getaway car, a long gun that Joker uses which looks similar to Jack Nicholson's in Batman 89, and the location of the Peregrinators Club. That was a spot used in Harley's debut episode, Joker's Favor. If you're a big fan of the Harley Quinn show but haven't watched too much Batman the Animated Series, you should absolutely check this one out. You'll see the comparisons right away, as this is where the Harley Ivy pairing originated. If you're looking to rewatch the best episodes of the series, I'd throw Harley and Ivy on your list. It's not necessarily one of my top 10, but it's so fun and different that it can't be ignored. And I know I've said that about plenty of other episodes, but this one really does stand out for how distinct it is. The tone is much lighter, and we get to focus on building a few characters that, before this, you wouldn't expect to see interact much. Give it a view for the entertaining romp that it is. Shadow of the Bat brings Batgirl into the series with a big two-part story. Part 1 has some strong setup, including appearances from Rupert Thorne, Two-Face, and more. But the heart of the episode is Barbara's, and Gotham's, relationship with her father Jim. Deputy Commissioner Gil Mason is a young hotshot in the Gotham PD. He's known for taking down multiple crime bosses in recent months due to a mysterious informant on the inside. The latest tip led the police to Rupert Thorne, who is subdued by the Batman before the police officially take him in. However, following the sting, Jim Gordon is arrested by Mason and several officers, citing evidence that he's been accepting bribes from Thorne for years. 
Due to the severity of the charges, the commissioner isn't even granted bail, as his friends in and out of the department come together to organize a rally in support of his innocence. Gordon's daughter, Barbara, thinks an appearance from Batman will convince Gotham citizens her dad isn't guilty, but the Dark Knight considers his presence there a waste of time, as he believes the people behind this plot need to be found and exposed immediately. He goes undercover to follow a lead and tells Robin to show up at the rally instead, but as Grayson is about to show himself, Barbara swings over the crowd dressed in a Batman suit in hopes of persuading the people that the Caped Crusader is really there. The rally is then crashed by gangsters as the younger Gordon finds herself in the middle of a shootout. I've talked about writer Bryn Stevens in these videos before, and this may be what she's most known for when it comes to Batman the Animated Series. Heart of Steel was a really strong and strange two-parter while Birds of a Feather did a lot to humanize the Penguin, but her handling of Barbara Gordon and Batgirl is the first thing that comes to mind when I think of her work on this show. Frank Parr directed over a dozen episodes during the series' run, and he was given the opportunity to helm Barbara's crime-fighting debut. Part 1 may have been the introduction of her powerful persona, but the daughter of Commissioner Gordon did pop up before this. She had a pretty prominent role in Heart of Steel that foreshadowed her capable, heroic side, and was shown willing to take a bullet for her father in the classic episode I Am the Knight. That's one of the many things I love about this show. They did a decent amount of setup for a few important characters before their transition into a more recognizable state. It definitely works in Barbara's favor, as we know her pretty well prior to her more involved stories. She even gets her own theme here. Shirley Walker, of course, was the composer on part one and put together that cue for the character. It's not the most subtle theme she made for a hero or villain, but the optimism and adventure in Barbara's personality definitely comes across. Gil Mason is set up as a romantic interest for Barbara, as Commissioner Gordon tries to nudge her toward talking with him more. That's one character I wouldn't have minded seeing more of prior to this episode, but you can't do that with everyone. He's built as this young up-and-comer who, even though arrested Gordon, is still in full support of him and suggests the rally in the first place. While he has made a lot of progress attacking Gotham's underworld, Bruce isn't so sure about his methods, and spoilers, we see that something is off about him when security footage shows him duck before the gangsters started firing at the rally. Even more damning, Barbara saw the face of one of those assailants who just so happened to be at Mason's apartment when she goes there to tell him this. I think a little more mystery with Gil could have helped this story a little bit, but they do hold off on presenting the depth of his involvement until part two. Gordon's innocence is of course never in doubt, but it is interesting to see that not everyone in Gotham trusts him. He's made enemies over the years, and plenty of them probably work with him closely. Maybe you don't know your father as well as you think. Maybe none of us do. In terms of Bruce's storyline in this, we're able to see the first appearance of Matches Malone while he investigates Gordon's framing. I love stuff like this. We got to see Wayne do something similar with the identity of Gaff Morgan in The Forgotten, but Matches Malone is a more well-known alter ego, dating back to the early 1970s in the comics. Kevin Conroy uses a little accent for Matches too. It adds another layer to the performance, and I really appreciate how much he tried to disguise his voice when playing this character. All that snooping around leads to Bruce being captured by Two-Face in his most intimidating scene since his debut episodes. Uh, matches Malone. I heard about a new mob. Thought I could make some more dough. There's something about you that I don't like. Nothing I can put my finger on, but I trust my hunches. Kind of like uh, second sight, you know? Matches is eventually KO'd a second time after losing one of Dent's signature coin tosses. Meanwhile, after seeing that Mason may be involved in the plot against her dad and Batman refusing to do things her way, Barbara officially proclaims her new identity. Let's see what Batgirl can do. Batgirl? Sheesh. What's next, Weasel Woman? Part 1 is a solid introduction of the main plot, with the Commissioner's framing, Bruce's undercover escapades, and that Two-Face scene being just as compelling as the debut of Batgirl. But does this story stick the landing in Part 2? Join me right here, same bat time, same bat channel, and find out on the next edition of Batman.
Shadow of the Bat Part 2 wraps things up in a satisfactory manner. A few thrilling sequences see Batgirl team up with Batman and Robin for the first time, as she sort of, kind of becomes an unofficial member of the crime-fighting family. With James Gordon still behind bars, Deputy Commissioner Gil Mason is confirmed to be working for Two-Face. Dent hopes to set him up as the new police commissioner to control a large part of Gotham's infrastructure. Discovering this is the newly minted Batgirl, aka Gordon's daughter Barbara. After clumsily helping Robin rescue Batman, who is being interrogated by Two-Face while still in the disguise of Matches Malone, the trio fight to save Jim Gordon when he's broken out of jail to make him look more guilty. Now in the clutches of Two-Face, Barbara, Dick, and Bruce do all they can to save the city's number one cop. Bryn Stevens returned to write and Frank Parr came back to direct, but Shirley Walker handed off the music composition to Harvey Cohen in this episode. That's definitely a noticeable difference, as the score is a little more stylized and less moody than part one. He even added some jazz in there. Melissa Gilbert does a pretty good job with Batgirl's voice. It's slightly deeper when she's under the cape and cowl, and she's appropriately cheeky when talking with Robin and Batman. What's he saying? Shh! Dork. Am I glad to see you. Do you mind? Sorry. They did change her costume just a bit from the end of the last episode. Instead of the black with blue outlining, her mask and cape are now mostly blue for a slightly different contrast. I'll be honest, it's not my favorite look. I think Batgirl slash Barbara is one of the few characters who benefited from the redesign for the show's final 24 episodes. It's been my impression that both the black and yellow costume and Tara Strong's voice are more associated with the character from this series. In any case, we do get a standout visual here with that train passing by to reveal Batgirl's foreboding stare. Great moment. The scene where the subway floods is another one of those sequences I can remember clear as day from when I originally watched this episode. It's just a really cool set piece, and how they get out of that situation using the train wagon made for a fun moment. After Gordon is broken out of jail by Two-Face's goons posing as Rupert Thorne's henchman, the commissioner looks even more guilty than before. I found it kind of surprising that even Harvey Bullock didn't know for sure if his friend was innocent after that. What do you think about the Commissioner's innocence now, Detective? I don't know. Come on, he has to be guilty. Two-Face isn't as intimidating as he was in that scene from Part 1, but he did remind us just who was in charge when Gil called him Harvey. Don't call me that. It's Two-Face to you, pretty boy. Okay, okay, Two-Face. Spoilers from here on out. Another giant coin ends up being Dent's downfall. This time, a silver dollar smashes him into the ground. Babs proves herself in the end by not only rescuing her dad, but taking down Gil and saving him when he could have died, cementing her characterization as a true hero. Although he unmasks her, Mason is said to be in a coma after this event. He never shows up again, so I'm guessing he didn't come out of it or had amnesia upon waking up. That might have been a nice story to follow up on, but because they didn't build up Gil before this, it may have felt a little tacked on. The ending of the episode promises more Batgirl, with hints that at least Bruce might know her true identity. She'd become much more important in later stories, but Shadow of the Bat was needed to establish Barbara as a hero worthy of teaming with Batman and Robin. It'd take a while for her to be fully accepted, but this was a good starting point. I do want to hear what you guys thought of this episode and Batgirl in general. There are some very controversial things that happen with Babs down the road, but when was the character at her best? In her early appearances here or later on after the redesign? Or, if you liked her most as the police commissioner in Batman Beyond, tell me below. The character had five voice actors share credit across the entirety of the DCAU, so let me know who your favorite is of those as well. No matter your opinion, she's a huge part of Batman lore, and in the end, may have been the closest to Bruce out of any of the other characters in this continuity. Blind as a Bat is a pretty self-explanatory title. Batman is forced to go Daredevil style in an episode that features a more threatening penguin than we've seen up until this point. It's also paced well and feels like a large-scale story with a lot of different elements about it working together seamlessly. 
Wayne Tech has developed a new military-grade helicopter with several state-of-the-art attributes, called the Raven X-111. At its unveiling and demonstration event, the Penguin and his gang are revealed to have commandeered the aircraft and attacked the people present. During the chaos, an explosion blinds Bruce Wayne. He's told he'll have to cover his eyes up for at least 36 hours to avoid permanent damage, but when the Penguin starts making serious threats in the stolen Raven, Bruce is compelled to stop him before he kills innocent people. To do this, he utilizes the tech used in the creation of the helicopter to make a helmet that allows him to see. There are limits, though. He can only see in red shadows and has to keep the helmet constantly charged up. With this handicap, Batman heads back out into the field in order to rein in the bad bird. Len Wein was back again, writing this episode from a story he collaborated on with Mike Underwood. Dan Reba directed the installment, and I will say, this all came together really well. It would be easy for a show to bungle a gimmick like this one and make it feel hammy or contrived, but they actually pulled this off in a captivating way. It might have been loosely based on a story called Blind Man's Bluff in Batman number 42 from 1947. There are some similarities, but I wouldn't be surprised if the creative team drew little to no inspiration from it. The idea of Batman being blind had a more high-tech solution here that fit in great with the show's aesthetic. Not wanting to be checked on by Wayne Tech doctors, Bruce tells Alfred to call Leslie Tompkins to the manor. She's the one who recommends Bruce not use his vision for those 36 hours, but she's called back when Wayne thinks he has to find a fast fix to his issue so he can apprehend Penguin. I mean, using electrodes to connect this gizmo directly to your brain's optic center? Those ZVF components I gave you, you wired them into this thing? I know how to follow instructions. I love how Leslie Tompkins goes from medical doctor to tech and welding specialist in this episode. I know Batman was telling her what to do with the helmet, but I would think Alfred would handle something like that. Not complaining though, the more Leslie we get on screen, the better. The red-eyed Batman is a really unique look for the character. It's just a small detail, but makes a big difference. I love the moment where he shows up in the mayor's office, and we see those red lenses shine within his silhouette. So what other options we got? None, gentlemen. You're going to do exactly what the Penguin wants you to. When his charging cable is severed, the helmet starts to go on the fritz until it's completely dead, leaving the Dark Knight in the dark. His battle with Penguin thereafter is a really uncommon one. The setting of a steel mill made for a visually interesting and precarious environment for Batman to navigate. Seeing him use his ingenuity wasn't too much either. He's at a significant disadvantage and is only human after all, but is able to use his other senses and a little bit of luck to outsmart old Oswald. It's no surprise that Bruce regains his sight at the very end of the episode, but the adventure he went on here presented some real challenges that was fun to see him overcome. I wanted to mention that the Penguin is much more menacing than usual in Blind as a Bat. There's just something about the writing, his delivery, and his overall attitude that felt like a major step up from his previous appearances. It could be that this is just a bit of a culmination of his many failed attempts to take Batman down and win the day, but he's not playing around in this episode, even when it comes to talking to his henchmen. Scanners show the area secure, boss. In that case, gentlemen, it's payday. If, in fact, this is a double cross, may heaven help them all. With the Raven's arsenal at his disposal, he takes down the entire Gotham Bridge and even destroys the Batplane. He's got a more serious, nasty streak in him that I kind of wish we saw more of throughout the series. This is definitely the closest he's come to taking Batman down. And even though he failed in the end, he still caused a whole lot of damage. Studio Junio did the animation for this one, and the episode looks pretty good. Not everything is amazing, but there are a few standout sequences that move really smoothly, and the extra attention to detail is obvious. It's not as well animated as their best episode in my opinion, Dreams in Darkness, but it still has a high quality throughout. The music makes this episode feel even grander in scale than the story implies. Steve Chesney and James Stemple pumped out something special. Everything's more heightened and bigger than a typical episode. That's not always a good thing, but it works great here, especially for the action sequences. And it helps Penguin come off even more intimidating. Warning, warning.
The red-eyed look for Batman is something we'd see again in his Silicon Soul, which is our last review for this year. But how it's used in Blind as a Bat is, again, a visually engaging way to slightly change his look. How it ties into the overall story doesn't make it arbitrary either. This is not one to skip past. It's one of the better Penguin episodes and puts Batman in a vulnerable position we rarely see him in. What I'm trying to say is, don't leave this one in your blind spot. The Demon's Quest Part 1 is the first half of maybe the most epic in scale story this show ever did. While technically not the first appearance of Ra's al Ghul, it is the first time we see him interact with Batman. The sprawling two-parter takes us on a globe-trotting adventure and things kicked off with a few big revelations in Part 1. After a night of crime fighting, Robin returns to his college dorm room to find mysterious intruders who knock him out with a tranquilizer dart. For the next few days, Dick Grayson is nowhere to be found. When Batman arrives back in the Batcave following another night of searching, a taunting note is discovered with a picture of the captured Robin. Just then, the legendary Ra's al Ghul and his bodyguard, Ubu, step out of the shadows, revealing that they not only know Batman's true identity, but also that Ra's daughter, Talia, has been abducted by the same organization who kidnapped Robin. Together, they team up to travel overseas in hopes of finding both missing parties. Part 1 was written by the late great Dennis O'Neill and based on his own story, Daughter of the Demon, from Batman number 232, dated June 1971. That story was also the debut of Ra's al Ghul, so they couldn't have gotten a better person to formally introduce that character into this show than one of the co-creators himself. Along with artist Neil Adams, O'Neill was behind one of the most definitive runs in Batman's history and was largely responsible for rescuing the character from his Silver Age campiness while bringing him back to his dark roots. The reliable Kevin Altieri directed both parts here and these are some of the most recognizable episodes he helmed. Having the stellar animation studio TMS bring this story to life also gave the Demon's Quest top quality visuals to showcase. Add in Michael McCutcheon's mysterious and more varied than usual soundtrack when it comes to this series, and you get a full-on classic. I can safely say that Ra's al Ghul's first big story is just as good as I remember it from way back when, and absolutely stands the test of time. It's one of the only episodes that doesn't open with a title card, as Robin's abduction acts as a prologue before we see it. There's just something more serious and dire about this story. And yes, basically every episode of this show is very serious, but I felt like they went out of their way to create a more threatening tone. Everything is just very ominous at the beginning. That picture of Robin that Bruce receives really hammered home how grim the situation was. As set up and off balance, Raish knows Batman's secret identity because his daughter Talia unmasked the Dark Knight to treat his wounds. Giving Raish that one up on Batman right away established he was no ordinary member of the Caped Crusaders rogues gallery. His intentions being seemingly very sincere throughout the episode didn't quite humanize him, but it did keep you guessing on what his endgame was and how exactly we were going to get there. Raish being visibly frail and in poor health gave us the impression he wasn't invincible, but of course the real menace of this character doesn't show up until a little later. David Warner adds a gravitas to the character that not many other actors could have matched. His voice carries a lot of weight to it, and he was just a perfect fit for this complex, centuries-old being. Allow me to introduce myself. I am he who is called Raish al Ghul. Humankind must be forced to serve the planet instead of its own appetites. The travel in this episode reminded me a bit of an Indiana Jones-style escapade. Seeing them hop around overseas and following clues was perhaps the biggest reason why this first episode stands out from a lot of the others in the show. Since we rarely left Gotham, this was an intriguing change of approach. Just seeing Batman operate in places we're not used to seeing him was great. I love that even though Raish knows he's Bruce Wayne, he never takes off his mask at all. Well, except for when he was taking down a panther for a minute. Ubu constantly shoving him aside so Raish can always lead the way is a nice little running bit that gets a proper conclusion at the end of the episode. Infidel. Call it overzealousness. 
I think I'll call it Strike One. Spoilers from here on out. It's not exactly a mind-bending twist that happens, but the episode plays it up as a reveal, so if you'd rather see this one before I go into the end of it, this is your warning. Turns out, the bad guy is the bad guy. Raish and his Society of Shadows orchestrated the entire ordeal to test Batman. He hopes the Dark Knight will take his place, since Raish is getting closer to death than ever before and has no sons. As Batman confirms when he finds Robin, the teenage boy Wonder was abducted by them and Talia was never kidnapped. In true Batman fashion, he explains he knew almost from the start that this was the case, but he had to go along with it to find Robin. I will say, his reaction to Talia showing up is pretty hilarious. I'm deeply impressed. As am I. Ready to go? It is a little different when Raish tells Bruce Talia loves him. The awkward silence and shocked expression made for a, I think, intentionally funny moment. My precious daughter loves you. The Ubu payoff was satisfying as well, especially considering the guy rammed through a steel door earlier. And that's three. From here, Raish collapses, dying. Including Batman and Robin, they all rush him to a Lazarus pit where he is submerged. This scene is honestly still pretty creepy, another memorable moment that has never left me. laugh is creepy as hell. One of the side effects of taking a dip into the Lazarus pit is momentary insanity. So when Talia tries to calm her father, he raises her over his head, continuing his maniacal laugh as we end on a cliffhanger. This is only half the story, but it's still a top tier episode. All the different talent that was involved in making this show happen gave us a variety of phenomenal installments, this two-parter being one of the more unique ones. Having Dennis O'Neill actually write it in his only credit on the series makes it that much more special. It's one of my top recommendations, but don't go anywhere because we still have the conclusion to this story to cover next time on Batman. <laughs> The Demon's Quest Part 2 is a fitting conclusion to Ra's al Ghul's first encounter with Batman. It features an iconic fight between the two with literally the fate of the world's population at stake. Dennis O'Neill wasn't able to return for the writing of this episode, but was it able to match the quality of Part 1 regardless? Following his resurrection in the Lazarus Pit, Ra's al Ghul seeks revenge on Bruce Wayne for turning down his offer to take over his organization and wed his daughter. Thought dead after being left in the collapsing pit, Batman later returns to confront Al Ghul at the Society of Shadows Desert Stronghold in the Sahara. There, Raish is planning to launch an attack that will ignite Lazarus pits all over the world, killing billions and restoring the world to its former pristine glory. The only person who can stop him is Batman. Director Kevin Altieri was back to direct, but as stated, Dennis O'Neill did not come back to write part two of The Demon's Quest. That credit went to another well-known comic book writer, Len Wein. This was his last writing credit on the show, and it definitely wasn't a bad way to go out. Both Wein and O'Neill shared the story credit for this episode, as it was once again based on one of O'Neill's comics. This time, it was Batman number 244, dated September 1972. Another Ra's al Ghul story titled The Demon Lives Again, this installment followed a few beats from the original pretty darn closely. The animation is still done by TMS, but doesn't look quite as good as part one. It's not bad, but there are a few moments where the slight quality drop off was noticeable. Then again, I did watch these back to back, so it might not be as apparent if you put some space in between episodes. They continued the abnormal characteristic of blending the title card into an actual scene. 
The recap of part one acts as the prologue before we see it this time. Picking up from where we left off, Batman is able to save Talia from her temporarily insane father. The Lazarus Pit rejuvenates the body but damages the mind for a short period. And the way Talia snaps her father out of it is equal parts funny and effective. Thank you, daughter. She literally slapped the sense back into him. I love that. After Bruce once again refuses Raish's offer to take over the Society of Shadows, the newly re-energized leader destroys the Lazarus Pit site with Batman and Robin trapped inside. The dynamic duo are able to escape and end up at the Wayne Enterprises building in Nepal. They're even shown out of costume researching where Raish might be heading to. It's kind of funny to imagine Bruce and Dick strolling into a Wayne Enterprises building in another country and just having the run of the place. I wonder if Bruce had secret rooms set up in every building he owns around the world where he can change in and out of costume. We did see it in Heart of Steel Part 1, so I guess that's not too far of a stretch, is it? Robin drops Batman off near a caravan of Society of Shadows members on their way to Raish's place. He takes one out and steals his clothes, but also never takes off the Batman costume, so he looks ridiculous, but also kind of cool. I remember thinking the same thing when I was a kid, too. The guy who looks back and waves at him like it's all normal made me laugh pretty hard on this last rewatch. Although they were wearing masks in that last episode, so maybe it's not that weird, but the visual timing of Batman jumping on the camel and the guy waving at him is pretty funny to me. Once they get to the stronghold, Batman is found out, and Raish finally divulges his plan to him. Since Bruce wouldn't become his heir, Al Ghul says he was forced to speed up his plan to cleanse the Earth. All over the world, bombs hang above the remaining Lazarus pits. A satellite called Orpheus is armed to set them all off remotely, dropping the bombs into the pits simultaneously and having the substance overrun the world. While the Lazarus Pits can bring life to the dying or dead, they will kill a healthy person. When Bruce mentions the human death toll, Raish responds with a dramatic, precise number. 2,056,986,000. I can see it clearly now for the first time. You are completely out of your mind. Oh, and yes, Batman is stripped of his shirt and cape because Raish wanted to make sure he wasn't armed with anything outside of his utility belt. But don't they watch this show? Batman always has a lockpick in his mouth. Always. Bruce is able to escape and blows up a lot of the compound before having a final climactic battle with Raish. Once again, it's one of the more memorable visuals in the series. We never see Batman look like that again, and the sword fight that ensues is a great moment. Spoilers for the ending here. Batman is able to stop the countdown to destruction as Raish is left defeated, hanging above another Lazarus pit. He actually lets go himself, and falls presumably to his death. Perhaps it is time I am finally one with the planet I so love. Has Ra's al Ghul and Poison Ivy ever done a team up in the comics or any movie or series releases I'm not aware of? Their goals are at times pretty similar, and I don't recall them ever working together in a big story. Anyway, this is all great stuff. Batman leaves in a plane being piloted by a waiting Robin after leaving Talia to go free and kissing her in a big romantic moment. The music swells, and again, it feels very Indiana Jones-ish. That sequence and Batman's sword fight with Raish are directly out of the Batman comic this is based on. But this episode ends on a not-so-happy note. <laughs> Damn, that laugh is awesome. It's a creepy, menacing little moment that shows Raish al Ghul has cheated death once again. He'd show up in a few more episodes after this. The full Demon's Quest story is a must-see two-parter if you want to check out one of Batman's best villains in one of his greatest interpretations. I think I like part one a little bit better, but part two is a worthy finish with one of the more memorable set pieces Batman the Animated Series ever did. Go on your own quest and watch these two back to back. Infidel! If you only knew how sick I am of you calling me that.
it's the last day of this year's Bat May, but folks, we are ending on unequivocally one of my favorite episodes of this whole series. It is very high on my list. Top five, maybe even top three. I love it so much and have rewatched it multiple times. I am, of course, talking about the unadulterated classic, His Silicon Soul. This episode is so damn good that I am imploring you to stop this video right now. Go watch it, then come back. Especially if you haven't seen this, you need to experience it yourself because stuff goes down right away that I don't want to spoil. I talked about it in my Heart of Steel reviews, but the execution of the opening sequence is essential to the enjoyment of the episode, and you should do yourself a favor and watch it. Even if you've seen it before, you should check it out one more time before watching my review so we can all discuss it with fresh takes. Go ahead and see it, then come back. I'll be here when you return. All right. With that preamble out of the way, let's dive in. Late one night, a few crooks are shown breaking into the now closed down Cybertron Industries. They're shocked when Batman bursts out of a crate to stop them. During the scuffle, the Dark Knight is shot by one of the criminals to reveal a metal interior abdomen and frayed wiring. Batman returns to Wayne Manor to see a shocked Alfred terrified by the sight of him. Another Batman is shown at the crime scene at Cybertron Industries and informs Commissioner Gordon that he wasn't the one who captured the crooks. Slowly, we find out that the Batman from the beginning of the episode is a damaged duplicate created by Hardak before its destruction at the end of Heart of Steel. Thinking himself the real Batman, the duplicate wrestles with the conscience of the man he was copied from as Hardak tries to repair his circuitry and bend him back to its will. The real Batman eventually confronts his double, and this all leads to a phenomenally dramatic existential conclusion. First of all, let's give credit to the creative team for this gem. Marty Eisenberg and his partner Robert N. Skur had a fantastic script. Seriously, the pacing and dialogue here are freaking incredible. They collaborated on two other episodes, one being the Riddler's second appearance in What Is Reality, which I reviewed earlier this year, and the second is a season two episode called Lockup. We'll get to that one next year, but I think it's safe to say that this is their magnum opus in Batman the Animated Series. Let's also not forget that since this is a sequel to Heart of Steel, a little credit should be given to Bryn Stevens for her writing on that two-parter. I believe I mentioned this in my Heart of Steel reviews, but the original plan was to have the climax of the second episode feature a Batman duplicate, but they ran out of time. Since the creative team liked the idea so much, they just gave the concept its own episode, and thank goodness they did, because as good as Heart of Steel is, this surpasses it. But hey, they couldn't have gotten there without it, so credit where credit is due. Boyd Kirkland directed yet another exceptional installment of this series, and I think this is one of his very best. I'd rank it just below my favorite episode of the show, Perchance to Dream, and on par with the likes of It's Never Too Late, Beware the Grey Ghost, and I Am the Knight. He always seemed to get really great scripts to work with, and he more than made the most of them. Dong Yang is credited with the animation services here, but Spectrum, the studio responsible for Heart of Ice, On Leather Wings, Robin's Reckoning Part 1, and a few more, did the layouts for this episode, and man, does their influence come through. The motion is fluid, the subtleties and shadows and detail are all there in spades. Anyone who worked on the animation of this episode deserves praise. I mean, all the visuals from the red-eyed Batman fighting Bruce to the half-Terminator version are borderline breathtaking in a story that plays out this well. Now, the music is just on another level here. Harvey Cohen and Carl Johnson knocked it out of the park. I don't think that ball has even landed yet, and we're talking about from the opening frame of the title card. The Twisted Batman theme is amazing. I love altered versions of that main theme, or any theme that I'm familiar with. When it's turned in a direction that creates an emotion within you for the episode or movie or whatever, that's film scoring at its best, and it's not overbearing or distracting here. The moments that need the music feature the music prominently, but it never takes over a scene from the substance of the dialogue. It's emotionally manipulative, and I mean that in the best way. It helps us with that intangible feeling.
Kevin Conroy turns in one of his best performances and he really got to stretch his muscles with how much conflicting emotion he put into his words. Getting to portray Bruce, the tragic duplicate, and the more robotic version of that same character gave him plenty of room to play with in a role he had to be familiar with at this point. There are two key moments where this episode reached the stratosphere. The first is where Carl Rossum, the creator of Hardak, regretfully explains to the duplicate that he isn't the real Bruce Wayne. You're a robot, period. You're lying. It's not possible. I remember names, faces, birthdays. I have memories, a past. Do you remember your first kiss? Your favorite song? It is just heartbreaking. This kind of idea had been around for many years before this, but the music, voice acting by Conroy and William Sanderson, and pure emotion of the scene strike at something deep inside. Sympathy, empathy, pity. I'm feeling all of these feelings for our cartoon robot Batman. If that's not well executed art, I don't know what is. And I've always been drawn to these kind of characters, personally. One of my favorite comic book characters is Ben Riley, the clone of Peter Parker who isn't the original but went through a similar crisis as this Batman to emerge on the other side as something different, yet never betraying who he is. Which at the end of the day, is still Peter Parker. But it's Peter Parker having to accept that all he's ever known has been a lie. How does he approach that quandary and how does he change? It's a fascinating idea to me. And that is what is at the center of his Silicon Soul. It's exemplified in the second scene that made this a classic. The duplicate is fighting back against Hardak's programming after taking over the Bat computer and setting it to take over the world's defense systems. He was made so well that Bruce Wayne's altruism, guilt, and dare we say, soul, is winning out after he thinks he killed the original Batman. No! I've taken a life. My city, my people, what have I done? It's gotta be up there with some of the best pieces Conroy has done as the character. Has to be. Just from a performance perspective, I've rarely heard him given the opportunity to go to those places so blatantly. And it's not forced. That outburst is absolutely needed. Like most of the best Batman the Animated Series episodes, this one ends on a poignant, haunting, and thought-provoking line from our hero. Could it be it had a soul, Alfred? A soul of silicon? but a soul nonetheless. Freaking brilliant. What an episode to end on. I'm gonna thank all you guys for watching this year's Batman. It was bigger than ever, and next year, there will be a ton more to discuss, so I hope you'll join me then, because as long as you guys wanna see it, we're going to make sure we get through all these episodes. Have a great rest of your 2021. You can find me in the meantime on my personal channel, youtube.com slash awesomewalter, on social media, the Twilight Tober Zone Marathon, which starts later this year, or in future fanscription videos right here on Channel Awesome. I'm Walter Benaziak, and I hope you had a fantastic Bat May 2021.